p.m. on Tuesday, August 20th, 2024, the Board of Commissioners of the Harbor Electric Department is meeting. Um, Commissioners um, Prevo, Demers, and Duncan are present, as is Interim General Manager uh, Johnstone uh, and uh, Beth Essery. And we have Ken Nolan with us tonight as well. So we have a quorum. Um, in terms of the agenda, there are two additions that I know of. One is uh, to pass resolutions giving you authority to sign checks. Um, the other is uh, to get people on the schedule for the select board meetings uh, in September, October, November, and December. So I would suggest we just, um, I, I don't care where we deal with them, but. They're both short, you want to just take care of them both right away? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's, it's, okay. they're, they're short. That's fine. Does anybody have anything else for the agenda? Is there a motion to approve as modified? I move to approve the agenda as modified. Well. Second. Okay. Um, all so let favor. me just let me just check something. Did you catch that, Beth? Um, literally, okay. <laughs> um, Roger, um, the second thing that Lynn, the second thing that Lynn wanted to add was, is it select get, board select board meetings? Who's going? Gotcha. Okay. And then uh, Roger moved and Reno seconded. Got it. And they're about to vote. <laughs> Sorry. Man. That's okay. All in favor? Motion passes. Okay. Um, let's take the um, select board calendar. It's unfortunate we don't have everybody here, but let's at least fill in the dates that we can. Yep. The dates of the meetings are September 19, October 17, November 21st, and December 19. These are all Thursdays. <laughs> any volunteers for any of them? I'll, of course, do one or two. Um, Why don't we assign them to Miles <laughs> and Michael? And they can we can all horse trade around. There you go. Okay, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> she heard that. She <laughs> heard that. <laughs> Miles gets the ninth. So what are the dates? Yeah. September 19, October 17. Does anybody have a feel for who did who did the recent ones? I did, she did the most I recent. I did the most recent one, and apparently I was on the schedule. I did the one in July. Right. Got apparently it. I was on the schedule in August, which oh, which I didn't. I should have checked. I didn't know, and I got an email from Casey. Mm -hmm. Except I didn't see the email until like the day before. Oh, so we know showed. Well, I let them know that we know shows. Okay. So it wasn't a surprise okay. no show. Yeah. And they were cool about that. That was yeah. Really didn't have, you know, it, it yeah. The meet we, we hadn't had a meeting in in between. Right. So it was Yeah, you wouldn't have had anything else to say. To say anything, right. Um, which is what I said. <laughs> yep. Um so September 19th. So I did the last one. Um I mean, if neither of you particularly want September, I'm happy to put Miles down for September. That's what I heard already. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, I think Mike did one recently. He might have done June, but I don't know. I, I, I did, did June, but I think he did May. I did April. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can't do October. Okay. Why don't you get me for October? What's the date? The October? 17th. Let me just see if I can put me down for October. Okay. And it's 17. Yeah. Oh. Um, should be able to do that. So, and what time is it usually? Six o'clock, although we're not the first thing on the agenda. Okay. And if there's, you know, if you make the date that there's a timing issue, you know, you can probably get okay. them to move the agenda around. Um, November, is that good for you, Rena? Can I ask who was October? October? Uh, uh, Roger. Roger is October gotcha. 17th. We're okay. talking about November 21 now. Okay. 21. Yeah, possibly yeah. after beer on. <laughs> Depends on the season. I think <laughs> Reno is November uh, 21, Beth. Well, okay. Yeah. December 19. On either of the 
I'm sorry? I said either would work. Okay, so we'll put you down for November then. And we'll give Mike December. 21st. 21st of November. November. And then Mike. Um, Mike, December 19th, Beth. Gotcha. Would you rather flip them? Never mind. Yeah, if you could switch me to December, that That's would fun. work better. Right, so I have grandchildren from Missouri coming. So, so Beth, yep. Reno is now December and Mike is now November. Okay. You switch. And that is December. 19th. So it's, so it's Miles, Roger, Mike, Reno. Got it. That's what I heard. <laughs> okay. The next item on the agenda is signature authority for Reno. Beth sent um, an email out at 5.01 p.m. yesterday, um, in which she attached the resolutions that the um, bank needs us to sign. The way the bank works, this is a preface, we can't just add Reno and have Reno sign something. We have to re-sign everything, but they'll do it electronically. So they'll send each of us an email that we can then sign electronically. Um, but we have that long resolution again that we have to pass. Are we sure we don't want to put Scott on there for going through the trouble? Are you okay? I mean, it's fine. I mean, you know, it's fine. Then, yeah, let's 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 do it for signing authority. You get that now. Yep. Got it. So I'm going to make a motion then. <clears throat> I move that we give signing authority uh, for the union bank accounts to Reno Demers and to Scott Johnstone, and that we adopt the resolutions that were attached to the email sent by Beth. Unbelievable, I just lost the email, I just had it open. Um, pages two of three and three of three. I, I wasn't going to read. Oh, no, I'm not saying read it. I'm just, if you wanted to acknowledge even one through seven on two, page two or two and three or three, however you want to do it. Well, I, yeah, there's a, there's a long list of things. I think just the resolutions that were attached, um, that are the bank's form resolutions that were attached to Beth's email yesterday at 5.01 p.m. Um, is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Beth, does that do it for you? Yep. Okay, just want to make sure you're comfortable. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposition. The resolution passes. Okay. Uh, now we have approval of some minutes. Resets. Two so, special, one regular. So we have the minutes from the July 15th meeting. Um, is there a motion to accept? I move to accept the minutes for the July meeting. Is there a second? Any objection? Any discussion? Hearing no objection, the minutes are passed. So Roger and Reno, in terms of the okay. motion spec. Yep. Uh, and then we have minutes from the special meeting of July 19th. Is there a motion to approve? Rena, were you raising your hand? Motion to approve? Motion. I'll second it. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Minutes are approved. Um, and then we have minutes from the special meeting of July 30th. Is there a motion to approve? I'm going to approve the minutes from July 30th. Reno seconds. Uh, any comments? Any discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 
um, minutes are approved. Which takes us to, to public comments. And we don't have any. Uh, so I think then the floor, Ken, is yours. Well, Ken's coming up. I, I do, would just note that the, um, you know, Ken, you, you know, a couple, when I first came here, one of the things we talked about was, um, you know, getting you all up to date on, on the, um, on, on the IRP process and what it takes to kind of do that. And so, you know, part right after that, VEPSA had their annual uh, strategic planning retreat and Ken did this presentation of kind of the state of the industry. And I thought, what a splendid kind of kickoff piece as we enter into the IRP. So um, it's pretty long. He knows he's going to buzz through it. Um, obviously, stop him when you want. Um, but, uh, you know, that's sort of the goal. And the only other thing I got to do before we do this. All right, Ken. Sorry to read the bagels while he's presenting. Thank you for having me. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So hopefully, if Tate can pick me up, Beth can hear me. And nothing's picking you up. Okay. Beth, can you hear him? Vaguely. Vaguely. Can you step closer yeah. then, even? It's okay here. There okay. we go. That's good. good. Thank you. Very good. Uh, so, yeah, Scott asked me to pare down, this was a presentation, we did at the VEPSA retreat that took, I think, an hour and a half of questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll breeze through it, and something piques your interest, stop me, and we can dive deeper wherever you want to. Um, oh, great. Uh, set up, this is set up to go from kind of the top down, from the federal government down to the local level, and what we're seeing in the industry. Um, Things we're seeing come down from various organizations that's as part of, conversations that are happening amongst the board of directors, and things we're dealing with that the, that the members and questions come up. So uh, the first slide here, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, Belco also does a strategic retreat, happened in June. They actually hired McKinsey and Company to do their presentation for them to kind of set the stage. And this is one of the slides that they uh, presented, just listing off the various different areas where we're seeing a lot of pressure coming down, a lot of change going on. And if you look at the list, it's pretty much across the entire board. You don't, don't have to stand, I mean, there's just a few of us here. So everything from renewable energy, uh, AI actually is becoming huge uh, at the transmission level in particular. It's being pushed very heavily. Um, we'll talk a lot about rates and affordability pressures and capital. Um, and actually there was a meeting today of the finance people from the utilities looking at Belco's capital needs and it's even worse than what I heard in June. Um, so things continue to move. Uh, the second page on the federal, um, there's two major <clears throat> federal agencies that really push what, what happens at utilities around the country. Um, I think you're all familiar with FERC. They've had two orders come out recently that are changing the way New England operates. Um, actually in reverse order here. The last one to come out is this order 1920, uh, which is all about transmission, transmission planning, interconnection queues. They're really revamping the way transmission planning is done and the way cost allocation is done amongst the, the utilities. So it's a 1300 pages, I believe in total. And the gist of it is they're really setting the stage for transmission to be built massively. They're really trying to promote construction of new transmission for renewable resources in particular, and setting up setting the stage so all the arguments over cost allocation and siting essentially have a predetermined outcome. So if you can't agree amongst yourself, FERC's going to tell you 
how it's going to happen. So, so has FERC, has FERC got the authority to override the states? I mean, they have it for gas, but they never had it for electric. It's not explicit, <clears throat> but there were changes to the Federal Power Act a few years ago that gave them override siting authority for what's called national corridors. And now the argument is, well, what does that mean? Um, how do you define a corridor? Is it, mm -hmm. does it have to be determined by DOE? Is it particular projects? Is it areas? Uh, and this order 1920 starts to push the boundary there on when FERC could step in and, and override a siting decision. Do you think it's going to help reduce our costs or increase our costs? Increase. Pretty significantly. I'll talk a little bit about that. More than, uh, than, than low growth. Yes. And we're doing this because if we don't need the, is it just because renewables are distributed and, and so there's more line needed to get to them? So FERC is seeing, there's two things going on. There's this huge push for electrification. And so all of the policymakers believe there's going to be substantial load growth as electric vehicles and pumps and things yeah. hit, hit the system. And you're coupling that with large amounts of solar energy, which are very intermittent, and you don't know when they're going to be there or not. So <clears throat> you're starting to see congestion on the transmission system where the generation ends up in, away from the load. And so the way FERC's anticipating dealing with that is you just overbuild the transmission so you can accommodate the big flows that go back and forth. And so they're, they're looking at building transmission and they're also looking at changing the way line ratings are done, the, the way the sensors are on the system trying to track what, what can happen to, to move power back and forth. But the bottom line is all of that stuff that's being done is getting rolled into the transmission rates. Yeah. All AC or some DC lines too. Or... More DC coming. Yeah. It's mostly AC right now, but you're seeing um, more DC be proposed. The problem with the DC lines is uh, Melco is actually looking at uh, changes to the high gate converter. They were told in order to get in the queue, it's 50% down and your equipment will show up in 10 years. 50% up front and you get the equipment in 10 years. That's a nice uh, business. You kid. I never heard of it. <laughs> wow. Why does the government regulate that? The DC is becoming the, the transmission technology in Europe. And so yeah. <clears throat> all of the investment is going to Europe. And if the US wants to get it, you've got to kind of buy your way into the queue. Well, from generation to conversion. Is only a one step. It cannot be broke down twice. So as it comes from generation DC to the point of load, then it's distributed AC. Right. Yeah, so we're seeing um, Velcro's looking at a significant up project um, from picking the Highgate converter where it is now and actually moving it to Essex and, and crippling the ability of that converter to move power. There's a couple, the one being proposed out of New Brunswick, we're seeing them two or three proposed in New York. And the question is who, who can get the funding and get across the permitting line first? Because some of them are competing against you. The converter in Highgate, if I'm not mistaken, is not a DC bed. It's AC dealing with 56 hertz, hertz to 60 hertz. I've worked in that. I didn't, I didn't know there was anything that wasn't 60 hertz or anything. Well, it's Canadian power versus US power. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I thought Canada was not 60. Mm -hmm. the, two, the two are not synced up. So yeah. you end up having to go from Canada DC back to AC. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some bad power flows back in the 30s that were yeah. probably triggered some of that. Yeah. 
Uh, the second order is order 2222 actually um, has a potential to be a bigger headache for distribution utilities. For sure. <laughs> it basically tells all the ISOs that they have to change their market rules to allow distributed resources to participate in the wholesale market. And that doesn't preclude someone from putting solar or batteries behind their retail meter and saying, well, I want those, that equipment treated as wholesale equipment, even though I'm taking retail power to, to charge it. To, like a battery in your basement, you could yeah. be taking real retail power to charge it and then selling that power into the wholesale market. And then the utilities somehow have to figure out what's being provided at retail and what's how, being provided. How, I mean, they, how small are they? Does the order go in terms of Very. size? You can aggregate, right? Yeah, it says it says the markets have to allow 100 kW or bigger, but then there's an aggregation possibility. So do you have someone who's aggregating up eight or 10 kilowatt units in customers' homes that can be bundled and put into the market? I worked on, I helped found a company that was based on that premise where basically 25 Hundred appliances and homes in the neighborhood equals basically one megawatt. So 250 equals 100 kW. So all you have to do is be able to control those devices, embed them into the market, and you have a business. Hmm. Which can all be done, you know, entirely on the web yeah. with algorithms. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, the trading is all. Yep. So, so ISO in the wing one is designing the rules right now. They've made a couple of filings for just proposals. Um, as you could, might imagine, the big catch that the utilities are trying to work through is what's metering look like. How do you mm -hmm. how do you meter an appliance and then segregate it from the rest of the load? And then, so it's this is probably by the time they get it implemented, it's a decade or more out, but it's coming. Big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that, that kind of is on the horizon and we're keeping an eye on it. The other thing that's really speeding up at this point is NERC, as uh, the National Electric Reliability Corporation. They're, they were originally a voluntary entity to looking at reliability for utilities and they, about maybe 10 years ago, they ended up with some federal authority. So it's now more of a mandate than a voluntary. Um, they report to FERC ultimately. So NERC comes up with rules that utilities are supposed to follow. They file them with file the rules with FERC and they're adopted by FERC, which allows them to become a mandate. Um, the big item, I mean, they've got hundreds of standards that they put out. Historically, all of those have revolved around larger utilities and transmission. Um, because they're trying to protect what they call the bulk power system. So it's the large 230, 345 kV lines, the most power across the market. Um, in the past two years, we've seen them start to put out standards that actually get down to the distribution level. Uh, this inverter-based resource standard, which just came out last year, is starting to look at the fact that there's so much solar and solar is all solar all uses inverters to connect to the di distribution system. But there's so many resources that use inverters now that NERC is finding if a large generator breaks on the system, the voltage fluctuations that causes can actually trip these inverters off the line. So all the small scale solar that normally you'd say, well, if they're all spread out, they're distributed, they're not going to cause a problem. You get a cascading failure going. And so NERC is now putting requirements on the transmission companies to figure out where these inverters are located, how big they are, what their programming is, because you can set programming on like a computer, um, and then factor that into their planning process. So they can start to identify well, what transmission improvements do we need to put in place to, to limit the failure on the distribution systems. 
The ripple effect is in order to do that planning work, the transmission companies then need to know what's going on on the distribution system. So we're seeing Velco start pushing for, well, we need to know where all the solar is, how big is it, who's the manufacturer of the inverters. And they ultimately they want real time information yeah. from any any solar generator that's a larger than 150 kW. Larger than 150. Yeah. So the small so the ones that have to just like the process in Vermont, which which at 150 you've got to get a real CPG. Mm -hmm. Um smaller you don't. Um yeah. And the question, I mean, right now they're set up so it's 150. <clears throat> Conceivably, once they get the systems in place, then you can see them start to push down the smaller. Yes, but I could also see people say, I'm not telling you, <laughs> or I don't know, it was put in by the people. But they're going to want it from us because we'll know. Do we have that information? We don't today, but we will. Yeah, we have thinking, a name for today, of, but not the uh, real time. Yeah, but I'm thinking right. of, we don't know who the who, who made the array you know the inverters or, or any you yeah. know any specific right. details about it yeah i mean i think what will happen is they'll go is putting the systems in place to collect this data they'll start with 150 kw and then what we'll find is the net metering license the, the permit you have to fill out and submit even though you'll need a cpg you have to fill out a form that'll start to include other information that's right that's required so we'll get there Sitting this net metering. How long? What? I mean, you said on 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 two twenty two. You said that's probably ten years out. Yeah. What's the? What do you see as the timing on mm -hmm. this? Uh, this one's probably three to five, and that's primarily technology based. In the the process of building the systems, has started already. In the meantime, Velcro is pushing for this now, for us to be taking first steps. Like they want access to this information. And their point on what they're put the way they're pushing now before the NERC piece is one, they need to know how much is on the system for their all their planning efforts. But two, they even need to start pushing for real-time information because there's enough solar that nameplate's not useful. Nameplate solar has got big, gotten big enough that it blows up their models. They're not reliable anymore. Um, so that, that so they're starting to push us to want to know solar even quicker than the NERC. Yeah, I was at a um, national group that sat on their board. They had a meeting in Washington, D.C. in April, and uh, they had NERC's president come and speak. And it was a bunch of joint action agency people like me. His pitch was, up until now, small utilities have kind of gotten out of this. You joint action agencies need to start prepping your members that this is coming and distribution utilities are gonna to have to meet the standards. And where we've stopped that transmission before, we're not gonna be in the future. Um, That's interesting. I mean, also because the author is having distribution used to be considered outside of federal jurisdiction. Yep. Um, yep. The lines are getting blurred. Could be some interesting Quickly. cases. Especially when the Chevron change that gets happened. Yeah. 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 Um, so diving down a little bit to ISO New England, um, they're they're changing all the markets yet again. Um, so they're in the process of changing the capacity market right now. It's everything is based on the one peak hour of the year when the loads the highest in New England. They're now looking at what they call a seasonal prompt capacity market. So they're going to split into two periods. They're going to have a winter and a summer. Uh, you'll have two peaks then, you'll have the summer peak and the winter peak. The, the bigger change is they're, they're now going to uh, determine how much generators can provide based on their seasonal numbers. So solar is the, the primary one where in the summertime they produce at their full mm -hmm. output. In winter, the snow cover, there's almost nothing. Mm -hmm. So under this new capacity market, so solar will get a big credit in the summer, no credit in the winter. And now utilities are going to have to match up fuel types to meet their capacity obligations in both periods. Mm -hmm. So that market's changing dramatically. Um, <clears throat> they're revamping the energy market to combine. Right now we have a reserve and energy market. They're two separate things. 
they're moving those together so you procure those products at the same time. Uh, I mentioned the accreditation. Um, so so this the split is likely to increase our costs because we're winter peaking, whereas the system is summer peaking, uh, or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Uh, it really is going to depend on the resources each utility has. Uh, Maybe it'll drive cool. people to hire people to clean up the solar arrays. It could. <laughs> it could. Um, well, your point, basic point that all our costs are going up is true across all of this. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, it was the specific reason you gave that Ken was disagreeing. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> the big driver here is the fact that in, in the winter, Dyson New England can't count on the natural gas plants. Right. Because there's a limited number amount of gas that gets into New England. And in winter, that all gets diverted to heating. So these big natural gas plants in Massachusetts, all of a sudden, when they call on them, they say, "Well, I got no fuel. Sorry, can't can't do anything." And there's no visibility to increase pipeline costs. I saw in New England, um, their president Gordon Van Wiley pushed for about five years, saying we need more pipelines. And he's got no traction. They had a pipeline proposed in Massachusetts and it got killed. The local opposition was so green time that so we don't need that green street. Right. Yeah. So that means New England's got you know pipes we have, and then when there's an LNG facility with five natural mm -hmm. gas in Boston. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, they're all fighting for resources at this point. Um, this transmission tariff that was put in. Um, I think four months ago now, big deal came. It was filed just before the FERC order 1920 came out. And it basically represents it was an amendment to the way transmission projects are determined in New England. Historically, ISO New England made the decision. If somebody proposed a transmission project, ISO got to say yes or no. And they were constantly getting beat by the states saying, well, wait a minute, you're holding back our energy policy by, by your decisions. So under this proposed tariff that they just filed, ISO is handing over decision-making to the states. So the states will have the opportunities to put out RFPs and say, well, we need transmission to do a certain thing. ISO New England will collect the responses and will, will evaluate them and the tariff, in the tariff, there's an agreement that if ISO's analysis of the benefit to cost ratio for the project is greater than one, so the benefits outweigh the costs, then it automatically will be rolled into the regional network tariff. And everybody in New England will pay for it. So that's not an allocation. I mean, that's a yay or a nay. It's a yay or nay, but it then falls into the, the embedded allocation scheme within the regional tariff, which is essentially pro rata share based on retail sales. Right. Okay. Cause I was confused when I saw benefit cost. I was trying to understand how you allocate based on benefit. Yeah. Costs. Well it comes into it does come into play. There's a two step. So ISO New England does the analysis to decide is the benefit outweigh the cost. If the answer is yes, then the project automatically goes into the regional tariff. Everybody pays pro rata share. If ISO determines <laughs> that the benefit to cost is less than one, then the states still have an opportunity to move the project forward if one or more of them agrees to pay the difference to get it, to, get it to one. So <laughs> if Massachusetts, Connecticut decide to pay some portion, then their customers would pay the incremental now and and once they bought it down to a one to a one benefit to cost ratio, everybody else picks up what's left. So it gets ISO out of having to make the decision. Now the states can be pulled. And who are the states is doing? Uh, it's gonna be handled through the regional entity called NESCO. And that is essentially all of the uh, Department of Public Service commissioners from each state sit on that board. 
And they have a lot of experience on transmission planning. Yeah. No. <laughs> the first project is going you, you forward. Pick up the sarcasm. Yeah, we did. <laughs> the first project we're seeing move is the offshore wind. Uh, the states really want to do a transmission network off the coast of Massachusetts to allow the offshore wind to be built. So they're trying to take the transmission costs out of the developer's hands and say, well, New England will build the transmission. You build, you focus on the wind turbines themselves. Did we become part of New York? <laughs> uh, that's in, that's in, what I said half jokingly. In theory, I guess I think we could. It'd be difficult, but. I've always wondered if we could become part of uh, Quebec. That's 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 um, <laughs> that gets more interesting by the day. <laughs> Just saying, we do have options. <laughs> so th that's this is being challenged in court. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. But the, for the first time, the states have actually stepped up, and they they have some authority to to decide on transmission projects, for better or worse. Um, just some numbers to put it in perspective. There are right now on the books, there is seven billion dollars in what they call asset condition projects uh, between now and 2032. And this is transmission that already exists, but was built in the 60s, 70s, and now the poles need to be replaced and but to upgrade an existing transmission. Yeah. So this doesn't count any of this new stuff Ken is talking about. Right. If this is just <laughs> everything <laughs> well, stuff theory. standing. Only some portion of that will need to event, but it's mostly maintenance staff. Right. right. <clears throat> but the problem is under the New England, what used to be called the Pool Transmission Facilities Agreement, which got rolled into the regional network tariff, all of the transmission that was built for the region back in the 60s and 70s stays in. Regardless of any other calculation, it was it was determined to be a regional facility when it was constructed, so it stays a regional facility. So any upgrades or replacements get allocated to everybody. Um, <clears throat> what they're finding, though, is this is coming under challenge pretty heavily because I think Delco does a pretty good job, but the utilities in, in the southern the national grid, Eversource, those guys are loading up the costs, um, putting whatever they can in aesthetic mitigation, you know, buying new right of ways. They're, so the FERC is taking a hard look at what, what's included as asset condition cost. Um, and there's a lot of argument over what's in or what's out. But right now, they should build up what they've got planned at 7 billion. Um, the latest estimate we've heard for offshore wind is two billion. Uh, although that's just received a uh, DOE grant to help move it forward, so maybe it'll be a little, the customer portion may be a little less than that. And how much? How much capacity for that two billion? If, if you don't know, that's okay. I was well, curious. the estimate the, all depends on the turbine they put in and how they locate it. But I've heard anywhere from. Uh, 1,500 megawatts to 3,000 megawatts. And that's just off of New England coast. You and get you get south of, of Long Island, and there's another 5,000 or so-ish. I don't know the exact yeah. number, but there's a lot south of, south of there that is all going to eventually interconnect, right? <clears throat> but that's, I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, because that doesn't include the cost of the... the, the of the turbines and maintaining them and everything else. No. Um, yeah. no, I was just thinking about some projects that I had worked on that were getting in that price range, but a lot more capacity. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it just came out I guess, this morning, actually, before I sent the slide deck out. Um, the transmission owners in New England put out their projection for the next five years, and they're estimating an average rate increase for transmission of 8% a year, every year. You know, that includes the 20% or not the 20%? On top of the 20%. On top of the 20%. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, so the 8% annually, because I was reading that as an increase in, in 
increase in power using you're, you're saying that's that that's an optimal eight percent average increase each year and the 20 percent this year was an interesting thing in that the cost component was about an eight percent increase but it was coupled with there was a large amount of solar on the system at the time of the, the transmission peak which meant when they determined should I say this right? When they set the rate each year, it's composed of two parts. One is the cost of service they need to meet. Mm -hmm. And the other is what are they assume the peak's gonna be? So it's a cost divided by peak and that sets the rate and they charge that yeah. for the full year. And then they have a true up. They either over collect or under collect and that difference gets rolled yeah. to the next year. Well, in this year, because there was a large amount of solar producing, the peak was actually less than they projected. And so they had this huge under collection. And so that gets rolled into next year. So I was just trying to remember how much of our costs are transmission. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I'm just wondering uh, what, what my head was going on is what is. There's like what 30, we need to 30 or 40 percent of our power supply bill, right? Isn't it usually for mostly at FEPSO land? Yeah. I that mean, includes capacity. It's if you put all that together. 30, I was gonna say it's transmission is typically around 20 percent of the yeah. overall power bill, and then capacity is another 20 percent. Yeah. So and these are all in play on this slide. So it's it's a big chunk. It's of, a, no, it's 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 clear to me that it's a big chunk, and I'm just uh, wondering, you know, if we've been talking about a rate increase. Right. Um how this is being factored into whatever we yeah, yeah. go to the it's not known and measurable. Yeah. The 20% we can roll in because yeah. that's been approved. Yeah. Well, that's the what future I, 8%. Yeah. We, no, the yeah. future 8%, obviously, yeah. we can't do it. But um, see, the point you're making, it, my whole, my takeaway of this whole slide when I first saw it from Ken was what's really happening at Isoland and partly reaction to what is happening in, from FERC and NERC. Um, is, you know, you usually think about utilities, like we're going to get everybody treated the same and we're all going to move in a steady state together. Well, this is basically creating a race to the top. You have to be like an early market leader. If you want to avoid paying big capacity charges and paying big peak charges, you have to be like faster on the technology drop because that's the only, because that is going to drive your capacity charge and your and your transmission charge is that peak. And so if if you are if you lag, you basically peak. anyone that goes fast, their money it's a, it is a steady state of how much money they're going to have, even as it goes up. So those that go quick are going to pay less, and that's going to slide off the table on, on the backs of those that go slow. Well, it also seems that for <laughs> someone like HED, and I'm going to a different topic for our yeah. discussion tonight. Is is in terms of Wolf at Hydro, yep. which is inside, so it keeps our transmission costs down. Yep. That when we look at, does it make sense? Yeah, we factor that into we that forward in, environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yep. So um, and yeah. and it also raises the question about should we be trying to get more capacity added at H eleven, mm -hmm. yeah, um, or someplace else. No, that's uh, right. You know, in, in or places in in our service territory. Yeah. Um, You're seeing a lot, a lot of utilities. GMP is one of the leaders in this. They've now gone all in on batteries because the the solar works to a point, but you can't count on it being there. Just like the hydro, I mean, Swanton has this problem where some years their hydros full out during the peak period. We had started talking to. A company about batteries. Mike, Mike yep. had had some discussions, yep. and I it just fell by the wayside. I'm not sure what happened we, on it. It's but, on Vepsa's list. I got to get a meeting with them. They've changed their name. I but, forget, uh, that, forget uh, it. Forget it. But, yep. uh, it was it was Delorean. They have a new name now. It's yeah, Marshall. Glenn. Glenn. Uh, yeah. I, I, they're they're still out there waiting to talk to us. Is the point. Um. So. Yeah. So that should probably move to it. Well, basically everything technology is going to have to move faster yeah. if we're going to avoid if we're going to be a winner because which which also you know so you're either going to spend a crap ton of money to get in front of it and lower your capacity 
and and peak charges, and you, but you're going to spend a lot of money that goes into rates, or you're going to do nothing, and you're going to have even more costs bear you than you know. So it's like pay some and get relief, or pay nothing and get buried. I yeah. mean, that's the way I would characterize this. Yeah. Uh, you can that's, disagree with that. That's <laughs> right. On top of on top of predictable versus unpredictable. Right. Exactly. Because you're going to see the transmission will be swinging well, all over the place, yeah. or you can get it the contracts where you yeah. know what you're going to be paying. Well, yes. so, I mean, it impacts staffing and that's it, but I think it impacts our staff. Of course it too. does. Yeah. All this technology stuff is in, in addition to the big stuff you were talking about, like large scale batteries and investments in hydro. The state, part of what the state's going to push, she hasn't got to the state yet, but they're going to force us to have, you know, derms in every home. Um, you know, so we're going to. And and so we're going to have customers call in the front office, going, "What is this thing? And how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to save money by having this technology in my home now? You know, and and that's going to get forced on us too. So it's not just germs. What is, what is, I'll let you talk about that. Sorry, <laughs> I, I should I should be quiet and let you let you okay. finish what you're doing. Um, <laughs> distributed resource management. System, oh, okay. The software piece that kind of starting people starting with that. And the last piece on this is um, aside from the transmission aspect, I assume <laughs> New England has its own budget and staffing, and their budget this year went up 10.5%. And when they were asked to describe why, um, a third of the money was for staff. They're, because they're seeing this technology change coming and they can't keep ahead of it, they're literally hiring 46 more people next year. So it would be over 700 people working for us in New England um, the end of next year. A third from inflation and a third on, on IT and cyber uh, technology. Um, so the money for staff was just two, two parts. One's hiring new employees. The other part, the, their PhD marketing, uh, market design people are getting scarfed up by large utilities who want to figure out how to play the market. So they can't can't pay enough to keep the wall. <laughs> they keep giving bonuses. Uh, diving into the Belco level, um, this is Belco kind of implementing what they're seeing. They, they're working on something called the VX platform. It's basically an addition to their SCADA system, which now allows them to gather and analyze the distributed resource information we're talking about that FERC and ICE. So Velco is in process of putting in the software to be able to gather all this information. They've got a huge fiber project going on to run fiber optics out to all the generators. Um, they're starting off with the larger utilities, but we're starting to see them talk to some of the VEPSA members about how do they do this. Um, and basically what we're being told is if you've got your own technology that can provide the data to Velco, and by data, I'm talking about the, not so much the nameplate information, but what is the generator producing at any given time? If you have your own SCADA system where you're collecting that and housing yourselves, then Velco will just tap into that information and take it. If you don't, they're literally talking about running fiber optics into your distribution system and they'll take them in themselves. Which has caused a lot of tension between VEPS and Velco. Um, we're telling them that's not an option. We'll figure it out how to get you the data ourselves. Um, they're also seeing this impact of the transmission build out in southern New England. So this is, is getting a little bit in the weeds here, but Vermont has benefited for, for decades from the fact that we have invested more in transmission than our load. So when the costs for New England all get put in a bucket and allocated out, we pay about 4% of the total cost. Mm -hmm. On the revenue side, Nice and New England's collecting all that money and then sending it back to all the transmission owners. Velco gets 6% of the revenue. So we pay four, we get six. So for decade, for the last three decades anyway, it's been a net positive mm -hmm. for Vermont. We're starting to see that flip where a lot of the construction is happening in Southern New England. So all the costs down there are going up and our load's staying about the same. So we're picking up larger and larger portion of the New England costs. 
the way to counter that is for Belco to keep investing. <laughs> Right, you get to this this arms race oh, wow. that you get in. Averitt and Johnson are having a field day. It's it's just there's no easy <laughs> answer to any of this stuff. Um, so Belco's actually looking at partnering uh, with a company called Grid United. So I mentioned the moving the high gate converter well. If they get their desired project, they would basically do a DC line from the Canadian border to Essex, rebuild the converter in Essex, and then have a tap come off of the DC line and go to New York. It's a $2 billion project, um, which Velco would be looking to invest a billion dollars in. They can get it to happen, which then continues us in our percentage of New England investment. But it's, a, but it's a bigger pot. Bigger pot. And in order to make this work, we would need to have equity investment for that billion dollars. So then you start, like how do utilities raise that kind of money? It's, I mean, but it's a bigger pot, but there are more units to spread it over. At least not in the short to medium run. Yeah. So, so you, there's two pieces to it, right? You, you would, Vermont, in order to, to keep our ratio to get the revenue back, we need to keep our, our percentage of the total investment the same. So go go looking for new projects. And at the same time, we're saying, well, then the transmission is all going up. But it's projects for the sake of projects. It's not. Um, in a way, there it would allow more transfer of power to Southern New England and New York. So there are benefits from it. But is that the right project for, for everyone? It's, Maybe it's, not. It is absolutely crazy. Is, I mean, and, 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 and Chevron's gonna make it worse, not better, right. because you're gonna have less regulation and less Congress it's very specific and What's the likelihood of that? Possible. Awesome. <clears throat> so uh, the strategic plans for 2024 or as we've been talking about, AI, I mean, they're they're looking heavily at how do they bring AI into manage this transmission system, uh, the new revenue sources, and the cap capital investment, how do they keep the capital investment up with the rest of the million? And the AI will cost and it will crash. Yep. And they want data, right? So I've already gotten an argument with Buck over privacy issues. What you've given away for data, it's, they're envisioning the information they're collecting from the transmission system is worth something to these Google or Microsoft or these AI companies. So you partner with them, you give them data, you get some revenue, you get technology. I mean, they're getting into a realm that's brand new. They don't really understand, mm -hmm. but feeling pressure to keep costs down. Right. So they're looking at how do we monetize this? Then we get to the good part: legislature. <laughs> um, they just passed, took effect in July, July first, uh, the new renewable energy standard called H two eighty nine was the bill. And it completely revamped the renewable energy standard, at least all the tiers except for tier three, the requirement to help customers convert off fossil fuel. That left pretty, that was pretty much unchanged. Um, because, all, they're because they're waiting for the clean heat standard. Because they're waiting for the clean heat standard. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it basically, so, so a number of changes. First thing it did is, <laughs> Historically, it's applied to retail sales. So whatever percentage of renewables you had to meet, it was a percentage of your retail sales. Honestly, I think this is a good change. The Department of Public Service said, well, wait a minute. If, say you're Swanton and you're 100% renewable. You're claiming you're 100% renewable, but you're only meeting your retail sales. Well, there's right. six to 8% losses that you're not covering with renewables. So you're not really 100% renewable. Mm -hmm. So they should 
minor wording change, but it basically changes the allocation. Whatever percentage applies in a place to total load, not okay. retail sales, which means your requirement goes up. Yeah. And it will average how much does it go up? What's the X percent? Uh, six to eight for most of the BEPSA members. If you're in Burlington, it's probably yeah. a little less because they're pretty compact. We're probably in that range here, though, Roger, I, I think. I would think so. The way our system is put together. Um, tier one, so this is the all renewables, any vintage, any any place, as long as the power can get to New England, you can buy these racks. That goes, there are different time frames for different utilities, but for the VEPSA members, it would be 100% renewable by 2035. And there's going to be a ramp up. So each year you'll be required to buy a little bit more. Um, what I've got here is tier 1A, the PUC just ordered, issued an order yesterday, and they call it tier four. <laughs> the legislation talked about it's 1A, now PUC is changing it to four. Um, this is new renewables. So it's anywhere in New England, as long as the power can, can get to New England, qualifies. But it has to be new, built after July 1st, 2010. And that July 1st, 2010 was picked to make GMP happy because that brings in their Kingdom Community Wind Project as a uh -huh. new resource. Um, so for VEPSA, that means we, we need to have 5% of our power supply from these new renewables by 2030, 10% by 2035. Then Tier two, which is the small distributed generations, the solar that everybody's building, uh, that right now is 10%, but it will go under this new legislation. It goes to 20% by 2035. The range for us, and this also comes into play for your Wolka unit, is all municipally owned hydro less than five megawatts in size now qualifies for that tier two, which is a higher value rack. Um, when so, it was so that's so again, day. that's a plus yep. for for Wolcott. Yep. Mm -hmm. The the tier one Rex, which is what it qualifies for now, range between four and ten dollars typically. Mm -hmm. The tier two Rex are worth thirty nine dollars right now. Wow, big jump! So it's four times the value at least. Um, and this does apply, the load growth doesn't really apply to you, but there was now a requirement, the 100% the renewable utilities were pretty much exempt from the old res. Now there's a requirement for them. So any new load growth they, they see, they have to meet that with new renewables. So there's a little bit of a step up for them. And, and nukes did not get included no. with renewables. Renewable, not green. Yeah. At the end of the okay. negotiation, it was me and Global Foundries arguing for nukes, and we had no traction whatsoever. Who cares? It's three cents a kilowatt hour. <laughs> really good economics. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's the economics. It's, base it's, load. it's the base Everything. load. It's, Everything. It's... I agree. Very foundries will be pushing the line. Yeah. Uh, the other big thing that's actually going to hit this session um, is the clean heat standard, or what they call affordable heat standard now. It's cracks me up to say it. Um, it's kind of odd. It's I've never really seen them do a bill this way before, but they couldn't reach consensus to actually pass it. So they approved a basic shell and then sent it to the Public Utility Commission and said, we want you to develop rules for the thing that we want to do. <laughs> and when you get the rules developed, you need to send it back to us so we can actually turn it into legislation. <clears throat> so the Public Utility Commission right now is in the process of drafting the rules. They're, the data they're supposed to send it back is January 1st, so it's in the legislature's hands for this new biennium. Um, the PUC chairman or new chairman has basically said they can't really do that. They they don't see being able to get all the rules in place in time, and the legislature is full of tough. 
How how what does it mean that the fuel oil dealers would be in the electrification space? So basically, the way that this portable heat standard would work is like we have with tier three, where we have to help customers get off of fossil fuels. Yeah. Now the fuel dealers would have to do that as well. Jurisdiction over the fuel dealers. I mean, the quid pro quo for no. utilities is we have an exclusive service territory, mm -hmm. and in exchange for that, we get regulated. Yep. Legislature can pretty much. I mean, I'm sure it'll be challenged if it passes. It'll be challenged mm -hmm. in court, but well, the legislature it will pass. <laughs> the legislature is basically saying that that business right now is harmful to the environment and harmful to Vermonters, so they need to regulate it. It's Really? I'm not saying I'm not saying that you know I I don't want them I I just find it no I get as, it as 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 uh, yeah what they're trying to do is find a role for the fuel oil dealers a role that the fuel oil dealers don't want by the way um, yeah, I, but th but that's kind of what they're trying to do and because then they also have to earn reps the fuel oil dealers so if they don't play they don't get reps and then they're out of compliance and. So I mean, they're basically forcing them to find a new a new role for themselves. Is that's my read from okay. afar. New um, business model, basically. And I think, just for it's worth, I think that the new res, it's going to cost something, but it's not going to drive as nearly as much cost. The clean heat standard, if I project anywhere near correctly, about this is really they call it clean heat. It's really electrification writ large. Mm -hmm. That's going to drive tons of costs because that's when every transformer in our system, our two substations. Everything has to get upgraded. None of it over a 10 or 15 year period will be big enough. We've already done the study in Morrisville. We know what it will cost. And it's basically everything has to get replaced. Because um, if you electrify everything, all personal transport, all heating and hot water, um, nothing's big enough. It wasn't designed to be big enough. Right? Your houses. right, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, when you say houses, you mean from the pole and then even the even the so what, what we're two hundred amp service would not be would be a minimum. Yeah, we're putting four hundred amps. Yeah, so have all to the, okay. New new That's in Vermont, rural yeah. areas. So, so Roger, new builds, new builds when people are coming in for all electric buildings now with heat pumps and heat pump out water and two EV chargers are coming in asking for four hundred amp services no already. Wow. That's happening wow. today. Wow. We've had a couple ask for six hundred. When we tell them it's like a hundred and sixty-seven kV transformer at thirty-two thousand dollars. They go, well, maybe I can make it with four hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I think the BM production, the ice storm was pretty common. I know. Yep, you're right. Well, well, we'll talk about the resiliency. It's all going to have to go under the yeah. yeah, I'm scared to death. <laughs> oh yeah, what well, you? I've said this for a long time yeah, now. We know. Outage in the winter, and people are well, not So, what people will I long before built the home like that, yeah. long yeah. before that, people will start coming here, even for a small outage. If people, have, I say today, people have pretty good tolerance for two to four to six to eight hours, depending on the person. You're going to be talking about minutes that people are going to say they're okay because they're going to freak out if they have no home heating oil, yeah. no propane. Yeah. You know, the minute the power goes out, they're not going to be tolerant. Yeah. You know, they're going to be like, I need to know right now what's happening. When it gets to 50 degrees, like yeah. it is right Same. now. They're going to say to go into it, which I'm going to be the generator. Everyone's going to have a generator. Yeah. But, so long as they're but that's okay. pretty significant. <laughs> to power a heating system. It's going to be big. Bigger than what we want. to gear up for it. Yep. Or be like on. Yeah. Yep. I have gravity wall, wood furnished. Coleman Lantern. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need any of <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I that's the one to watch. Um, okay. because that's gonna drive much more cost, I think, than and res. It's, and it's gonna be on um, when we're gearing up is, is, for this session. Are other states doing the same thing like this clean heat standard? Because this is insane. This California is doing it in a different way, oh, like I'm just saying, that, but they've, they've like basically passed laws that when you can't sell combustion engine cars and they've said you can't build new construction with fossil fuels. 
So they've, they've done things like no, this, I mean, not like exactly, but test, and Massachusetts has done some of it piecemeal. Yeah. New York has done some piecemeal, but, I, but it's a small cohort. When California is like, a, it's more of a mandate right. approach yeah. where this, they're trying market. to market structure yeah. and it makes it much more complex. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, you think about the cost of living in this state. I know. Yeah. Um, it's going up. It, 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 just, it just, and I'm, I am terribly concerned about climate change, but I just wonder whether this is the way. Yeah. The, the, so to, to, to tell the other side story, so the argument is based on current costs of electricity, um, it's about a dollar fifty a gallon equivalent for gasoline, and it's about half the cost of propane and oil. It's about equivalent currently with natural gas. So if you're Chittenden County and we add new costs on, you're paying more. But the argument of the policy people is outside of Chittenden County, where there's not natural gas, all of this, even if you like double rates for electricity, everybody wins economically. I don't buy that. I'm just telling you what the argument is. Um, but so just just so you hear what yeah. what's out there is that yeah. so close to you, right when you when you sit with the speaker her perspective is if i look at the total energy burden then electrification actually is a good thing for low-income customers because we're reducing their overall cost across all their bills they're paying yeah. I'm not so sure that's the case. I mean, first of all, there's so many buying clubs and stuff for propane and oil mm -hmm. that people aren't paying. Yeah. Oh, I don't think they're factoring in what we were talking about a few minutes ago, which is all the transmission. All in one basket. Yeah. Now, if something goes wrong on the electric grid, you're just you, out you, of, we've, out we've lost yeah. all the diversity, the resource yeah. diversity. Yeah. I mean, we're going to be putting tree wire on every single run we got that you know because we're not going to afford to underground it like gmp because it doesn't make any what no, they're I proposing was being, I was, I know, I was makes no sure. sense just like their battery proposals don't make any sense but but there are lower cost ways to really harden our grid and that's what we're going to have to do yeah all that stuff has to happen so down at the puc and the eps level um, we have a new chairman at back to who we actually have known for a couple of decades now pretty pretty pragmatic person, um, but very much in analytics. So the previous chairman was an attorney um, who didn't have a lot of business experience. So what ended up happening is the staff at the PUC spent a lot of time on the legal aspects of filing, but they didn't really dive into the analysis. of so it kind of took on a face value of what people were submitting. This chairman is really requiring his staff to do due diligence on the findings. So getting a lot tighter to get things through. Um, we're seeing that pretty heavily on the IRPs, which Scott said, I mean, when you do the next one now, um, they're, they're essentially requiring system studies, load flow analysis to, to analyze how the loads are in your system, how you would deal with electrification, um, the things that Morrisville just completed are, are coming up in the MOUs we're getting now to get IRPs passed. They're requiring the next one has to have a study. Um, a lot more modeling on electrification, like how many residential companies and customers do you have? Well, what does the load look like if every customer puts in a heat pump? If everyone buys an EV, what, would, what is the load going to do? Um, and getting more complex and figuring out what's not only what's the power supply look like, but then what's the distribution upgrades going to be required. Um, we've gotten by with kind of hand waving at it until you know we do a high and we do a low case, but now they want much more almost appliance based analysis. We're going to get apply the end use forecasting to some what, degree. What are people going to use? I was just thinking about the whole heat pump thing. Because the heat pumps are only good down to a certain temperature, and it gets colder than that here. Right. Um, Agreed. And so if you don't have a backup heating system, you are screwed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've seen some people leave the heating, their existing heating in place. Yeah, I mean, it's like, 
And new construction, I don't know if we're seeing it here as much, but when I was in Burlington in particular, and I think Morrisville had a couple of these, the developers now, when they build new apartment building, new condos, it's heat pump with baseboard electric heat, strip heat. So when it gets down to minus 20, you're just back resistance to, heat. Back to the future. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, flexible load management. What used to be called demand response. Um, the DPS in particular is all over this. They feel that the wave of the future is utilities controlling customers' loads. And we're we're taking the position that we should give them price signals and the customer decides what they want to do. The DPS is like now where we agree with GMP, you should actually be turning stuff on and off in customers' homes. Um, and they've actually put a working group together that is trying to come up with statewide standards of how to do this. And really being driven by efficiency, Vermont. Yeah. That, that's who wants to do this, which would be a train wreck for any place not Chittenden County. Well, yeah. Since well, this will drive a lot of costs. Yeah, you know, make more efficiency, yeah. Vermont, even. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, new thing this came out. This is Bernie Sanders' baby. And I actually got call onto a call with the senator explaining to us how we needed to get out of the way and make this happen. Um, he's not very happy that he get all this money and we don't, aren't building solar projects yet. Um, but he got 53 million, it's a $6 billion bill for the country. Vermont got $53 million specifically to implement solar on low income homes. And there's two components of it. One is uh, offering rebates for rooftop systems, small rooftop, and then a larger uh, grant to do community solar. How generous are they? Don't know yet. The Department of Public Service is actually what the center of course, of course, people keep that. Right. That's right. The center of the year, who I assume would qualify, don't have a lot of money. Right. right. So if it's free, they'll do it. If it's the, a lot different than free. I would say how to do it. The intent of the legislation was free or close to free. Yeah, right. How Vermont implements that will free money is all will be another question. There's some ways to do it though, Roger. I was doing this in 2011 in Washington, DC. You take the the developer takes the tax credits. They take the advanced depreciation, they own it for the first seven years, and they turn it over to the low income person right. for a dollar right. and they exit. And now the low, and the low income person gets, you know, a 5% bill reduction for the first seven and then gets the system and all the benefits after yeah. that. Yeah. And there's right. ways to do it. Like, yeah. I, mean, I was literally doing that in That's 2000. That's a free way to do it. Sign here. <laughs> and we'll right. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, so I mean, we'll, we'll see. The way the state historically has dealt with that money is they, play with it for a couple of years, they figure out they don't know what they're doing, and then they hand it to the utilities and say, figure it out. Right. <laughs> yep. So what I'm expecting is, you know, 18 months from no, now, we'll right. get a grant and be told to figure it out. Yep. Um, other utilities, we don't spend a lot of time, we've already covered most of this stuff, but we're we're getting hit with the marketing for this zero outage initiative GMP is doing, the in-home batteries, stuff that makes no financial sense, but customers don't know any better. So pushing oh, yeah. um, and it's the second part of the other utility slide, slide is the I think the important thing which is when you add up the billion dollars plus that Velcro was going to be looking for with the distribution upgrade costs that we're seeing Morrisville's you know prime example when you're looking at tens of millions of dollars on the distribution system and the technology upgrades that are coming we're starting to think about how to, how do you raise that kind of capital? Um, GMP at the last Velco board meeting we said, no problem, our backers, Canada, have all kinds of money, just tell, tell us what you need. Um, but BED, VEC, VEPSA, we're all like, ah, we, we need to think about this. How do, we, how do we work this capital situation? And if we can work with VEPSA on that, it really is helpful in multiple ways. One, you know, they have they they can structure some bigger financial arrangements than any small utility can. Yeah. But secondly, and you may or may not know this, there's you know there's um, we have a 
a cap under which you can do borrowing without any voter approval. Yeah. And anything that BEPSA does for us doesn't count against that cap. Even though it's debt, but we owe it to them, it doesn't go against that cap. Because it's state or it's right. quasi state. Or it's considered, it's, it's debt to us, but we just pay it but we, our but we, bill. Yeah, but we have in a way, right. we're, just, we're the members. So, yeah. So it, it's, it just helps us extend, mm -hmm. you know, how far we can go. Yeah. You know, so well, it, it is really useful. In well, that yeah. And, you know, my perception is the, the world is, has plenty of capital. Sure. But a small organization, entity like us, can't access that capital efficiently. Whereas if you aggregate, yeah. Yeah. You, there is, there's going to be capital for this, what it costs. Right. And because it's so attractive, it's such a secure. Yeah. We just have to but figure out how we just have to figure out capital. It, it yeah. almost doesn't matter right. what size it is, and it, it's it's yeah. so it needs to be bigger. Yeah, it, it, needs, it be needs, bigger. needs to be bigger because otherwise it you just be keep paying for it over and over again. Yeah, we so, just need to figure out how BEPSA can even get enough of our share of that billion dollars uh, for us, since since we get the guaranteed rate of return. You know, as you're saying, it's um, but even they. Whatever our six, yeah. So ours is six percent share. Is that what we are? So, so that you know, we got to come up with 60, 60 or seventy million dollars of debt for just for Velcro. Yes. Keep the DPS having only going for a interest because yeah. we can count it for our rate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So because that's what we got dinged for. I know we did too. So anywho. Yeah. So oh, right, right now we. Well, our last great fund, and the reason that we didn't get a good chunk of what we asked for was because the department said that we should be borrowing more rather than financing things out of current rates. Um, they don't like pay as you go, which is what the communities have always done. Along the way, I don't well, me either. either. Yeah. Makes no sense at all. So for us, I mean, we're starting to, within BEPS, we're starting to talk about most of these projects we've done over the last 10 years, 12 years, um, we use local banks. We're going to have to be getting back into the bond market. Yeah, yeah. This is, that, that's, that's this my is, point. This yeah. is, to get this really attractive. Because the bond market will value it properly. These local loans we look at, they don't value it as, oh, it's a utility. It has this right. class. It, 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 and the world you live yeah. in, you, you yeah. have the interest rates down, down, yeah. down. So. Yeah. Because it's such a high quality. Yeah. Did um, can can Vepsa borrow the municipal market? We can. Okay. Well, that's great. I'm thrilled. I mean, but this is making me all of this makes me think that you know if the if the feds are sort of pushing this. I mean, I I a lot of my career has has been spent doing financings with multilateral and bilateral and development finance agencies. You know, we've got these federally funded international finance agencies. I mean, it's, it's for US investors financing their projects. Which there should, be, there, should, there should be some kind of an energy finance yeah. entity mm -hmm. uh, that, that's um, in my next to me. Yeah. <laughs> there isn't right now. No, there is. But but there is a massive requirement yeah. across the country. Yeah, we on, on on innovative technology, DOE has has a program because I I can deal with this council on some of those. But um, many states have green banks that they've developed to help with what you're talking about. And Jigger Shaw, who is a guy that did a lot of that, is now the key finance person at DOE. Um, and Jigger Shaw is a quite a good friend of Vermont's. Like you know, we all know him. So he could be helpful to us. So there's there's a lot of pathways. But but that's something that, that and I guess one of the things I think about is how much, because I know that Bex is out there lobbying and doing this, but it seems to me, at least for Harvard Electric, we haven't been kicking in our two cents. Right. And it seems to me that it's important for all of us to be kicking in our two cents. Exactly. It's not it's not enough yep. to just leave it all no, on, on Bex's shoulders. I agree. Even if we're just piggybacking on you. Yep. Yeah. I mean, th there are all kinds of discussions going on. Um, Mike Pichak's actually coming to the Velcro board meeting in October to talk about the, the states considering taking some of their investments and turning it into loans to utilities and other 
green technologies as a way, you know, that's what, what, what municipalities do quite often loan between departments and say, well, if I'm getting more than, if I'm, I'm getting uh, less than I'd have to pay for a loan, but then the other department's getting more than it would get if we were in the bank. Yep. It's a win for both departments. Right. The state's starting to look at that. Can, can we take state money that's getting you know 1% in the bank and, and invest it in the utilities at a low interest loan and make some of this happen. Mm -hmm. So there are, I think there are opportunities coming, but we need to start preparing us to take advantage of it. Um, on the member, perhaps the member front, I mean, we're seeing the same stuff across the board. Um, whenever an elected board turns over, there's questions that come up, should we keep the utility? This is crazy, it's too complicated. Um, I think I've been to six conversations in the last year with people like, should we keep doing this or not? Right, right. Um, the workforce issues, you guys are dealing with alignment, several members are dealing with alignment challenges. Um, yeah. I was on a call with the Ludlow lawyer this afternoon. Um, you know, Tom Petraska has given notice he's retiring in Ludlow and now they're trying to figure out what do we do? And there's no, experience of managers in the wings mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out how to hire people um, but we're seeing the changing employee expectations and it used to be municipal employees you had a good pension good health insurance well at least the vepsa side is what's my salary i don't care about those other That's benefits right. let's mm -hmm. look at the number uh, oh and by the way i want to work from europe i want to work <laughs> in Vermont. Right. um the IT obsolescence we've hit a few times, um, regulatory push, customer expectations. We are, we actually have hired a uh, consultant, uh, Jackie Lemmerher, who helped us on the AMI project. We had hired her team to help look at what's a roadmap for some of this new technology. How, how does each member deal with that? Um, so they're, they're doing interviews and coming up with a plan for each utility. And then coming back and looking, well, what? How do we package that together? Or are there some utilities in the same place where we can jointly procure, uh, make that work? Um, and then just across the board, we're seeing residents aren't as committed to municipal utilities. In a lot of cases, they don't even realize they own it. Um, so an educational aspect has to be brought in. And then just to sum it up, um, you know, climate policies, especially in Vermont, are just they're creating havoc and going to more, more so since clean heat standard gets passed. Uh, federal level on down, I mean, the train's on the track and there's a, you <laughs> might be able to move it a little bit, but it's happening. Um, the infrastructure build-out's coming, digital transformation's being required, Electrifications getting embedded in all the policies, so that's that's happening. And then the renewables, um, you know, Vermont's now leading the pack, but all of New England states are in that eighty percentish renewable range or higher. Uh, so it's becoming a real challenge to operate the system. People don't realize it. I, I said this when standard offer net metering got put in place a decade ago. It's really becoming true now. You have a franchise territory, but you don't have a monopoly anymore. Right. People can buy their power from Sun Common or Green Mountain Solar. Or, you know. Well, and it's the and it's it's the solar developers who are driving this thing. They've got this sort of renewable energy Vermont, and it's yeah. it's a trade association. Yeah, yep. that's what it is. Um, yeah. And and nobody's calling them. Yeah, they don't. They aren't doing that way. They've done a very good job at aligning with the environmental groups and then calling themselves an environmental group. But they're not. They're not. And, and from my standpoint, I mean, I would say the, the VEPSA ecosystem is not designed right now to, to meet these challenges. We're, we're moving as fast as we can, but our IT systems are behind um, it's pretty clear, like all the members, most of the CIS systems, I think you're in a little bit different spot, but most of the members, their CIS systems are 20 years old. They weren't designed for this type of environment. So 
people are having to upgrade their own technologies. We're trying to figure out how to, you know, get the AMI in, get the GIS systems in, which are technologies most of the utilities around the country have had for a decade. And we're kind of getting it going at this point. Um, and the capital we talked about, and we're figuring out how to deal with that. But I always say to folks about what we're headed towards. You, some of you talked about the fact that we're, you did, Lynn, about we're going to need more staff here and we'd be able to do more here. So it's an end state. We need that and we need a much stronger and more capable EPSA. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, yeah. to yeah. survive this, People we need both. People capable of understanding and communicating right. with the staff of EPSA. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, um... I think it's great that you're recognizing the gaps and then talking and thinking about filling them. And I think our, our view is that while we can hustle and try to incrementally improve what we do within Little Hardwick Electric, that's not, in my personal view, that will, will never be the full. But our only hope is to aggregate and combine and, and work it as a group. But you're the first, you're all that exists right now. So if you can come up with ideas and concepts, you're filling the need in the most efficient way. The alternative to that is what we talked about, which is, you know, going back up to the top question. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know where that means. Yes. I mean, the VEPSA board, this this really started to hit home for a few people at our VEPSA retreat. Um, and coming out of that, I was asked to put a special meeting. So the board is meeting September 16th by itself, <laughs> me and the board, to talk about like, how do we deal with this future? Are there ways we can collaborate? Are there ways we can share resources? What's the capital look like? I mean, that conversation is starting right. in September. It's well, it makes, it makes you wonder. <clears throat> That's it does a lot of the, the non-operating side, although plus the power supply, which is yeah. for for its users as is. It, it, it makes you wonder whether there should be some some kind of a stronger association of 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 public yep. utilities in Vermont that that really is much that doesn't have the kind of local control that's much more than if we, if we want to have if we want to have something that is separate from GMP and and, yeah. and the yeah. costs. Um, yeah. And wouldn't you say that, you know, speaking for our board, not everybody's here, but we're we're ready to entertain that. So it sounds like we've got a couple of other places where we'll ask the question. And then you, you know our unique structure of the select board. I think our select board's ready to see this in the journey too. So I don't think yeah. with us you're not gonna have any um rocks thrown in the gears of if we're we're open we just have to find a path that works. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it it there's just something fundamentally wrong about having we're talking about highly technical things and to have people making decisions about these things who don't understand them at all. I mean I just looked at you know who was running in in, in our districts. I mean, I, some people who understand. It, so. You're worried about a legislative democracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but it's it's in the face of the Chevron decision because what Chevron did, at least at the federal level, we had agencies that had built up expertise. Right. right? Okay. But that's out of favor, right? Or potentially so. Out of favor, the Supreme Court just yeah. gutted it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Sure did. Um, and it, it just... Um, yeah. Expertise is, is underrated. Yeah. To the, to the point, to the point, to the point you raised... They're, they're not evaluated they're now. To the point you raised, so, Roger, the, um, you know, one of the things to build on what Ken said, you know, so my view is that BEPS has historically tried to think about all members as one cohort. We had right. some projects occasionally where one person would drop out or another, right. but mostly it's all for one, one for all. And part of what's emerged is a dialogue of, which 
it's not been affirmed yet, but what I would say the momentum is towards is there's a lot of that where we all have to be doing exactly the same thing working together, but it's okay to have sub cohorts too mm -hmm. um, for one issue or another. If you need it. And, it, and so instead of thinking that what we have to have is 11 municipal members of BEPSA, what we want to have is the same influence and this, you know, the same number of meters, if you will, same number of right. customers. So in other words, they, you don't need consensus to take action. Right. So if a group of two or three want BEPSA to help figure out how to solve an issue that's going to keep it alive and keep it municipal, then that's worth BEPSA doing. Um, again, I'm saying it's as if it's already happened. Um, I really mean to say there's momentum that way, <laughs> yeah. which I think is the better way to say it. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing, I think, what I'm seeing at this point is kind of a geographic conversation yeah. going on. So you've got Enosburg and Swanton in the Northwest are, are sharing resources more talking about how do they use the same CIS? How do they have their linemen share on call duties and that sort of thing? <clears throat> seeing a similar conversation with Orleans, Barton, and Linden, where you know they're all struggling with meeting the needs and looking at how do we share resources. Barton and Orleans already have an agreement for linemen. So Orleans linemen are taking care of Barton's distribution system. And they're looking, can they expand that? Then you're seeing the same thing happen here, you know, with our Morrisville mm -hmm. are working together and seems like you know a little bit of momentum to see whether that works yep. differently. Um, and then Johnson Hyde Park's their own thing. They're <laughs> kind of in the middle of this monkey ranch. But I think Johnson's open to that conversation yeah, too. Yeah. So, uh, but from my seat, what's the practical geography of those collaborations? You've seen it develop now a little bit. How far can it stretch? It seems like Johnson and Morrisville and Huntley is a contiguous. Pretty school. much. Yeah. I think, I think it, that's the key. I think you can't jump more than like one service territory in terms of mean, meaning a gap. Like part of yeah. WEC's problem is they have these gaps all over the place where they're driving through BEC and GMP territory to get to their next customer. I think when you do too much of that, you're going to lose all the efficiencies. At least at an you know, operating Right. Yeah. Like I think, you know, Linden is, there's, there's something between Linden and Barton, but it's not huge and there's not 14 of them. You know, um, so it's it's close enough. I think if you start getting too much distance, then any efficiencies you're going to gain, you're going to relose in in travel time and just all those sort of things. So, but then there's other aspects in each of our systems which we frankly don't put much attention to, like cyber. Yep. Well, there, the all thirteen should be saying that's you hire third parties or hire people yep. and let's do a BEPSA wide solution. Did they ever, by the way, did they ever see the results of, or did they have one? They had one. Oh, they had, did they I, see I it? I don't know. Did sure. you ever see your cyber study results? <clears throat> okay, well, we can, like, we'll talk offline. Yeah, yeah, make sure you can get it. Yeah, yeah we, we got a grant, a grant, federal grant funneled through the state to yeah. do an audit of all the members two years ago. Yeah. You know, I know in Morrisville, I shared the details of it in executive session because you're basically telling people how to attack you if you do it in public session, right? right? So, I mean, we went pretty deep into it there because, yeah. You know, so, you know, there wasn't a requirement that it be shared. I just, I don't know what got shared or not here. So we'll talk about that offline. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. 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 I just well, wanted you to know it actually happened. What your, you said your, happened. <laughs> your point's valid, Roger. I think there, there are some of the software... For, for example, the, the Jackie Lammerhurst group is looking at SCADA and they run across a company called Surveillance that does this with the other joint action agencies where there's one SCADA system across all the utilities mm -hmm. and it's kind of managed by the joint action agency. So I think there are those type of software solutions or IT solutions that, lend them so. that yeah. we could do something across all 11 if folks were interested in it. The operational side, the alignment that's working, stuff like that is kind of geographically right. focused. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. you're looking at maybe two or three Tyler. or four that would partner together. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have a great meeting. Move the ball. <laughs> We should, speaking of me, we should keep you moving. We have two more yeah. big topics to cover yeah. with Ken tonight. So, I think this was bigger. Uh, yeah, probably quicker. Yep, that's what I have up.
You're okay with that, Madam so Chair? Just a quick refresher on how the system works. First line, um, got electric meters and water meters, <laughs> all using 400 megahertz radio to feed these um, called data collection units. Those are on your poles around the system. And then those data collection units you use either fiber optic or um, cell phone. They can use microwave if you need to, but they try to use cell phone or fiber uh, to feed back into the software that allows you to manage it. Um, system architecture, it's just a general diagram of how it works. So you get the DCUs at the top. Those are the collection units in the field. They're feeding information back to this one software package called the Clara One. And that has both uh, a platform to allow you to manage the meters. So you can actually send signals to every single meter telling them what to do. Um, and this MDM or multi, um, meter data management system, which houses all the information, all of the usage data and all the information from their back from the meters. And how big a leap is it to then go into the household? Because this is sort of stopping at the meter. Yeah. How big a leap is it to then go into the household and, and, and to have both uh, data from individual appliances and potentially control of the individual appliances? So, as, as another phase, I'm not trying there to. Are, there are add-ons of other devices okay. that you use that, that can go inside the home okay. and use the same network to okay. get information back. Um, <laughs> First one to come out, Claire has actually got an uh, electric vehicle charger yeah, that, that, makes start. that has a meter built into yeah. it. So the person has the charger and you're getting the data back on that particular appliance. Yeah. So, well, and it, you could centrally set that the only time you can charge that vehicle mm -hmm. is or your rates for yep. charging the vehicle are. You could potentially time. do that. What we're finding though is most of the control side of it is you going when AMI first came out, everybody thought the meters would be that control mechanism. What's happened in the last 10 to 15 years is the market has moved that to be more based around the Wi-Fi in the customer's home. Hmm. So it's not, okay. the meters aren't, okay. today, they aren't really envisioned to be that control mechanism. Okay. In some cases, I feel EV charger, yes, you can do that. Okay. Um, but if we're talking about controlling, you know, heat pumps or heat pump water, here's that stuff. It's typically going to go we through the test of our wife. But, here, but in terms of information flow, even if it's not going from the meter to the customer, but it's coming back to the utility, the utility can be transferring that. I mean, either through an app, through the accounts, through whatever mechanism. Yep. Yep. The, other, the, other, the other thing you can do through an AMI meter without any additions is any large appliance leaves a signature in the data. So like you can actually, you can look at AMI data and pull out the EV and, oh, really? and your dryer. You, you're not going to pull your refrigerator out. It's not a big enough load, okay. but anything with a reasonable load um, that has a shape to it, there's already analytics that will just pull those right out of the AMI data. And this company is one one of them told me was Vigley yeah. is the big one. But they actually look at the app and they say, oh, that's your air conditioner, that's your yeah. washer, and it's your yeah. So extra. yeah. Um, so that that a Clara One software sits in the middle, and then you've got below that your CIS information, um, GIS information. So the other things that this software feeds once it has the data it can provide that to other uh, software that you're using uh, one unique thing on our system we set up is it's all the vets of members sit in one database you can think of it, each each utility is almost set up like a division of vets yeah. as far as the software is concerned and that allows us to you can get in your staff can get in and look at harder data but then BEPSA has an overlay where we can do analytics on the whole group, um, which brings another layer that the other system didn't have. <coughs> so drivers, why you might want to do this. Um, I probably missed some here, but just throughout what, we, what we're focused on as far as the analytics side. 
Um, once you get the data and you can link it to transformers, for example, pick the customer information. So the meter is tied to a customer, tied, and the customer then is tied to a transformer, tied to a substation. Then you can start to do analysis on that, like blind loss analysis, figure out which areas of your system have the biggest losses so you can start to focus on upgrades. Um, from a BEPSA standpoint, load forecasting becomes huge, not only for day to day in the ISO markets, but as we're trying to project out what your system is going to do, we can do long term forecasting much more accurately because we then have. Cut class load shapes <laughs> rather than having to estimate from somebody else. Um, all of these meters send back voltage information. So every meter on your system will send back the voltage at that customer location. So you can get voltage profiles and start to see where you have large drops or where you. Do you know about Ting? Ting? No. Ting. It, it measures it. it... Some insurance companies are starting to push them, but mm -hmm. um, mine wasn't. But I, I went and spent hundred dollars to get one because it'll tell you it constantly monitors the circuits in your house, so that if there are changes in voltage, if there are shorts and stuff like that. Yep. And so, yep. so when we had the outages last week, I didn't know how long I was out because it was the middle of the night. But did you get any? Did you get anything today? Because our voltage test on our on across Vepsilan was today, the voltage reduction we're required to do as a possible response, we have to test once in a while. So we actually drop the voltage on the system and see what happens. <laughs> I think it happened in Hardwick today. I know it happened in Morrisville today, yeah. but it was system wide, right? It system -wide. Yeah, it was like eight o'clock this morning or something like that. Anyway, eight o'clock for the non skater systems. Okay, well, it, it didn't it didn't set up a notification, but um but just curious. No, no, I'm just looking at the uh oh this is real time. No, where where is I'm still learning how to <laughs> where all the data is on this, but um no, there was there was voltage variation today, but I mean there was every day. Yeah. Showed a low of 113 and a high of 121. But um 113 sounds like it would be. That's probably oh, but, that's but, about the right amount. But I've had I but I there was one day when it went down to eighty. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, um, yeah. so the, the, the voltage readings uh, actually Burlington uh, when they did this they they found one of the meters was sending back voltage readings that were out of bounds for the type of meter it should have been, and they found out that it was actually a loose ground, so that service was at risk of catching fire and the meter was able to send them a warning. Mm. Um, so that it can help you find issues on your system, help you figure out where you've got a lot of uh, losses, which also turn into voltage drops and yeah. see where you need to do upgrades. Um, one of the big things we see right off with this is potential equipment overloads. That's why we're pushing the GIS system so heavily because we can tie the CIS information and, and the uh, the 15 minute usage data to the maps and then get a visual picture of, well, this is the load on a particular transformer, this is the load on the line, and, then, and you can identify transformer overloads or underloads. Um, there was a, with all the, with the transformer shortage, it was actually a Massachusetts utility last year that used this technology to look. And instead of having to go out and buy transformers because they couldn't get any, they actually were moving transformers around their system and said, oh, well, this one here, optimizing. when we put it in, it was a huge load. Well, now the business is gone or something else there. So the transformer is oversized. We can take that out and put it at our big load over here and then take a transformer that's smaller and put it in this one. So they were that's able great. to move great. things around and save money. That we, didn't, we didn't factor that into our analysis. So, you know, I don't know how you would, but it's, but it's clearly a- So, so who, who is actually doing, you're talking about human beings interacting with the system right. to influence their decisions, run their HEV better. I can't think of who 
Who in our current organization would be looking at that? So for me, I think it'll likely be a combination of partnership with BEPSA and or BEPSA contractors, but it would probably be driven, if you break Brian's position into the two, it should be. Yeah. It wouldn't be the working foreman. It would be the ops manager or the yeah. electric super, or whatever you want to call yeah. that job. Um, you know, that would be, you know, I know I, I have Dave Heller looking at these so things today. you agree today. with the way we're staffed today? It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, we've got this great yeah. system, but we got nobody here. Right. I mean, thank thank goodness Brian does what he does for us, but it doesn't work. It's not, um, um, it's not a him problem; it's an us problem. Yep. You know, and we're we're looking right now. We just today hired uh, another power analyst. Yep. So our senior analyst is actually got a data and analytics background. So I'm envisioning that position would be filling in some of this, like doing the long term analysis, yes. giving reports to the yeah. members. And then more of the operational side would be right. each utility doing their own thing. And helping advance the thinking within each utility. And this right. is the way to hear it. I've done this once and look right. what we learned. And now you can do it every month. And we can do design scripts so that it's right. you know, push a button and the local guy gets the report with what he needs That's to right. do that. Right. Right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, outage management. So the meters are going to send back notice whenever there was power. And also, whenever power is restored. Mm -hmm. So, there's two ways you can handle that. That will actually can be moved onto your GIS map. So, if, if your crews have the map, that will populate with who, which meters are out or restored. And also, it'll link into an outage management system, which helps you figure out where, where the problems are. And that, by the way, once it's up and all working correctly with all this data, can essentially be live for customers to look at. So they don't have to call. They can check on their phone and find out if their power's out. If they're in Connecticut and they're curious, they can look. And they don't have to worry about <laughs> whether the utility knows that right. their power is out. Right. So a lot right. of benefits. That, that's the only reason. I mean, I, I when right. I go out, I call because I figure that's useful information. It is. Today, that's the only way we might know. I mean, the guys are out looking for things, but that's how we find out today is people call us. Probably <clears throat> buttons. Quite often, a call will come in after the power has been restored, and then a second trip back. Right. Not really. The other nice thing is, you know, the guys when they look at these maps, and basically in the outage management system, we have every outage is a star. So, like, they can look at the map, and if the way they get it today, they're just getting random addresses, addresses, and they don't necessarily know if it's a whole run or one or one or two houses. They'll look at their iPad and it'll be like, oh, it's actually that run, that whole circuit's out. And they'll know just by their knowledge of the system, they won't have to even drive out to know. No. So then they can prioritize the most important stuff correctly. It's actually quite a often. fuse, but half yeah, yeah. way. That's right. <laughs> quite often, people are quite forgiving. You know, yeah, well, they're great. Not in an emergency and one person in you know, a, a circuit will call and nobody else. So you go to that person first and well, if they're the first, you didn't travel to the end, but you know, yeah. if it's evening, you will look and say, oh, there's no lights. <laughs> we better go back, check. You know? But you'll know that as you're driving. You drove by a few, so yeah. you get a general idea. But yeah. 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 So with, with this, you'll, you'll get the notes on every meter. You can get a visual of it so they can more easily determine where it is. The, the people call half they restored. Yeah. This allows you to, you have to work out the operating procedure for who can do it under what conditions, but you can ping the meters to say, oh, person called said they're out. Well, I'm going to send a signal and see if the meter responds. And that'll let you know either they're wrong or they've got a breaker inside their house. And right. Gone, and it's not you. But from a customer service standpoint, when you tell the customer, it's yeah. not us, it's you. Right. Yeah. Um, so you don't want us to pay our customer charge you nine hundred dollars for doing that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, which so look at your breakers. Yep. And if you see that the meter <laughs> is out, they can also pay the further meter and see if the line is out. That's right. Exactly. So really useful for outage. Yep. Yeah. That's one piece for load flow studies. Um, you know, you need the GIS so you've got your map laid out with the parent-child relationship, like from the substation out to the end. But this then, with Empower, the software we're using, it allows us to tie the usage data from the meters to the map. 
So when you're providing information to PLM or whoever you're using for engineers, they don't have to guess what the load is on the various circuits. You're giving them the, the information tied directly to the transformers. Because absent that, the way they do studies now is you, we give them information that says, oh, well, the load at the substation is five megawatts, and then they allocate it out based on transformer size. Might be accurate. Maybe Ish. not. <laughs> Um, or now you just automatically can give them that allocation and they can work with that. Yep. Uh, the distributed energy resources or net metering, um, because in particular, because the solar has its own meter now, you'll be able to net that and see within the MDM what your total solar load is. You can start doing analysis of how much generation you have on your system. It'll be very visible. Uh, similar to the pinging meters, you can do remote disconnects. All the residential meters have internal disconnect ability. Um, so your customer service staff can sit in the office, tell particular meters to shut power off. So that comes in handy when you have uh, people selling their house or moving out, non-payment. For a while, the Department of Public Service just didn't, they wouldn't allow us to disconnect for non-payment using this, but now they're starting to put in place procedures where it can happen. Presumably you can reconnect them yep. that way too. Yep. So you can. Somebody doesn't have to, if they have paid their bill, they can get reconnected. Some of the utilities are doing, you, know, you call them and say, hey, we're going to disconnect. And we do that outreach. People will give them a credit card or something over the phone. And so you, you literally can take a credit card over the phone and connect them without anybody having to make trips either way. And then there's a customer outreach component. Um, it's not in this first phase, but there's a modules you can add on to the MDM, which allow the customers then to be able to see 15 minute data and what the usage is and so on. So that's kind of the analytics side. From the rate side, we're seeing that this is really where the regulation starts to come in. So we're being pushed really hard to do time of use rates. Um, and when you see the transmission cost on what they're doing, time of use rates actually can be a way to have the customers pay for those costs. And if they can move power yeah. off the peak period, yeah. they save, you save. Yeah. Um, so the system as we're envisioning it, it'll come with that time of use ability. We're gonna have to- We'll get the data. Right. We'll have 15 million data on so every that we customer. can then bill if, if we go through yep. all the process to get it in place. Right, but sure. it'll, it'll also give us the underlying data to let us know how to design the rate in the first place. Because yeah. yep. without that, yeah. Right. So the way the way it, the way we're thinking it will work is you'll get the 15 minute data on all on all your customer classes. Yeah. We'll be able to use that to design a time of use rate that makes sense, yeah. gets the rate levels correct. Once that's approved by the PUC, then it can be implemented directly in the system. So now that, let me just express at this moment that's exactly the kind of thing that BEPSA is better equipped to do than hardwood electric. <laughs> and yes, it's it a fool's mission for us to 11 times over trying to figure out. Correct. Assume, assume, but we really should do it as soon as we're equipped. Assuming, well, I mean, BEPSA is going to be the one because we looked at BEPSA for the for the rate. We don't have the staff yeah. to, to do rate design and rate cases right. anyway. Uh, but it, it it may not be one size fits all. It, sure, but they'll sure. have the data by utility where yeah, they can, where where they can do it. Plan A and Plan B. Yep. Yeah, and then the commission will see what the variation is. This is an example. <laughs> this is an example, though, where we need more of BEPSA because they have a great current staff that does rate making and all this sort of stuff. They don't have sufficient to ramp up to this level. So when I was saying earlier, right. we need a yeah, bigger, more capable. This is an example of that. In my, that's yeah. my opinion. That we, Stephen, Amanda, are great. Sasha, that other people with electric vehicles that are charging tonight. Nobody else is. You know, I mean, yeah. your other stuff is going to yep. run when it's going to run, especially if your house is all electric. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, you're you're gonna see EV EV owners trying to take advantage of this. You may see people have you know, 
of water heaters or something that are willing to. I, I, to I think you, you, I don't know. It seems reasonable that homeowners could decide what time of day they're going to turn on their, their drive. Well, yep. There's some there's some there's some things, but I mean if you're cooking dinner, you're cooking yeah, dinner. Yeah, that's right. No, dinner. Okay. I'm not I'm really discretionary. If it's when are you gonna charge your vehicle? You know, when you, are you gonna if you have air conditioning drive? and it's hot, you're gonna have the air conditioning on because that's when you're gonna have it on. Yeah. yeah. Um it it's this having I know the technology is strange, yeah. but the stock of electric using appliances changes slowly over time right and so it takes time a long time years before you're going to see load shifting as a result of okay. time of day in the aggregate that's not to say there aren't individuals but um and and having presented the study on that to regulators who said i see what you're doing it all makes sense but I, it's not what i believe yeah <laughs> No, it care. should be. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wish it would happen. Yeah, so flexible load management, not so much the management side, um, having the information to think, figure out when, if we go down the path. So this doesn't have a module like for an interconnect like between a water heater and a heater. No, I mean, the Clara is adding technology to go in the home, so it's, it's on their roadmap. Yeah. But it gets back to, I think, the question of what's the most efficient way to interact with the appliance. And in most of the markets saying, well, that's Wi Fi at this point. It's not using the meters. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's a case. No, I'm thinking from the standpoint of like interruptible rates, yep. um, which I'm not sure how we would do through Wi Fi. Well, interruptible. The, so there are, you could sign a contract with the companies that manage those pieces and they can basically, they don't so much the interrupt, they, they change the settings. So like for cooling, it, it's two degrees warmer and for heating, it's two degrees cooler and for hot water, it's 10 degrees cooler. And, and when you manage, you know, 2,000 of those over a system. Rather than, than disconnect. Right. right. So there's ways to do it. And then you can incentivize people to do it. 50 bucks a quarter benefit on their bill and things like that. And. This is already being done in certain places. Right. Yeah. This the meters handle that right now. Um, what they call load limiting, which the state yeah. doesn't like, but you can set how much power you let the meter pass through. Mm -hmm. So you effectively you don't like England years ago you, you don't care what they, yeah <laughs> <laughs> you don't care what they do behind the meter, but they can only get so much power and they figure out what, what are you going to use it for. Yeah. Uh, and we're seeing, I, this, I threw this on because I, I think the legislature will try to go here They're nuts, but they put in place already that we have to have a separate rate for electric vehicles. And you're starting to hear conversation about, well, heating should have a separate rate attached to it. Right. <laughs> And so yeah, you, we had those 40 years ago. You, we had you know, space heating rates. You start to get into... Having to have a separate rate for touch different window. appliances in the hall. <laughs> so, yep. Um, and then some of the other um, requirements we talked about for and Nerf with the data, um, you know, being able to getting the net metering, the solar generation as a separate meter in the MDM, allow really streamline the reporting that we have to do on some of this stuff. Where now we're having to ask until. We're asking the Harvard employees, and can you give us the list of, of solar? Well, we'll be able to pull that out because of the separate meter attached to it. So, I think from a reporting standpoint, it really helps. Um, and we're seeing with the PUC, the load flow study I already mentioned, but they're also GMP came out a couple of years ago with what they call their solar map. So, they looked at all their circuits and whether they could accommodate more solar or not. And this DPS engineering staff is just enamored with that. So we keep getting questions about it. Um, that's something that's just what well, I'm still, I'm not exactly sure what Stowe has done, but 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 they will tell you in certain parts of their service territory that you can't add salt yeah, that right. the circuits won't. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, Stowe has done it's more of a, an engineering study, and then they have to keep updating it. GMP has put an algorithm in there that makes that more dynamic on their GIS system. Yeah. 
Um, so a little bit on the project status is where we are today. So we filed with the PUC and got approval for all of the reps and members to implement AMI. That's been approved. So there's no incremental regulatory approval that Hardwick would need to go forward. Um, the PUC basically set it up that the eight who have contracts are free to go and the three who don't have contracts, I have to report back by April as to what your final decision is. Um, Jacksonville a month ago said they're gonna go forward. We're trying to get the contract signed now. Um, scheduled to talk with Barton in a couple of months. And obviously we're having a conversation, but um, it's a compliance filing that I need to file next spring to say, yeah, there's 10 in, there's nine in, whatever the final number is. But if we decide that this is something that we want to do, mm -hmm. there's no advantage to waiting. Correct. No. Fact, I think there's just a, there's only disadvantage. Right, exactly. I mean, financial. <clears throat> So you, you have no steps other than signing on the contract. There's no filings or anything required. And it's essentially a form contract. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, you're not negotiating different contracts. They're all basically right. the same. Everybody signs the same, same, same thing. thing. Yep. Just um, have, it just has our different numbers in it, yeah. which he'll show you in a minute. Yeah. So um, we've started the project. So we, we had to file with the FCC to get the RF license because it's a licensed frequency. So we have those in hand now. The meters configurations have been designed, what data we're bringing back, what periods. Um, or about likely next week, we'll be ordering what they call the first article. So you get one box of each type of meter that you test out, make sure it's doing what you think it should do. And then once we sign off on that, then we're going to free to start ordering meters. Um, the data collection unit locations are being finalized. So we've got four utilities in the first group. Swanton's the lead, they're the guinea pig for most of this. Um, Orleans, Northfield, and Enosburg are the other three in the first, we'll call first tranche. So the Claire is actually visiting their utilities now, trying to finalize which poles are these collected units going to go on. Um, Probably two to three weeks out of finalizing that before we can place orders. And just so you know, Hardwick has been kept in the third tranche, which is the last one, yeah. um, just to keep the idea alive in case you decided you wanted to do it. Yeah. Yeah, we tried to set this up as though everyone is in and, and opting out as well. We just got people off the back end, but yeah. it doesn't disrupt anything. Yep. Um, and we're starting the customer information system and GIS integrations. So there's a software connection that needs to happen. Um, Swanton again is going first. And we just got the quote from their provider today, Cogsdale. Um, so the, the hope is we'll get a kind of a template scope of work, but then it gets easier with each utility to copy. Uh, and Eclara has worked with um, Keep on to say SEDC, but I know that's not their name now. Uh, I, I, Meridian, Meridian is it? That's on Meridian. It's Meridian. Yep, yep. Yeah, and Beth told me that the it's been done with Eau Claire before, and it works well. Speak for yourself, Beth, but that's what I think I heard from you. Um, Meridian and Eau Claire have been very close partners for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. So we're expecting that part of it wouldn't be difficult at all. Um, and then we're, we're in the process of putting the outreach plan together. So there's a couple of components of that, doing kind of a broad education. And then when you actually get to the point of meters, there's a very prescriptive process you have to go through to make sure people can opt out if they want to. So cost side, <laughs> these numbers are pretty much finalized now. Some some parts of them are, are hard and fast. They're under contract with the clear. And then some of them we've made assumptions about. Uh, we've broken the project into a, a common and a specific piece. So the common piece is we've taken anything involving the initial software development, the communications network, the collection units, which some of them being a shared across two or three members. 
um, because of the location, they could be right on the border and serve a couple of utilities. Um, the training aspects, G the GIS, because that's, you know, we're managing the GIS project too, and everybody's going to have to go through this connection. Um, and then the management support, the contractors we're hiring to help manage the project. We've pulled that into a common bucket, which is being allocated to all the members based on the number of meters that are in the project. So those, those costs are lumped into a bucket and then allocated out pro rata share, basically. So we have more meters than anybody else? Uh, you've got, you're about 12% of the meters total. 4,500, I don't know. No, I was, I was just looking at, you know, the, 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 Mm -hmm. You know, we were two hundred thousand on the on the. I'm not sure what HW stands for, but on the network piece. The, the network is the DCU component. Yeah. And if that's being allocated on the number of meters, then we have the most meters of any of the utilities. You might. I'm not. Do we have more customers? I mean, isn't there a relationship between the number of meters and the number yeah. of customers? I think you and Lyndon are pretty dang close together. I, I've always thought you were the two biggest. And I'm, are we okay? I'm, I, yeah. I, just, I could be wrong, but I thought you two were the had the most meters. No, and, I mean, if we had more customers, we had more customers. I yeah. just, I just didn't. I never thought about. It. Yeah. Okay. Uh, You're. Close. Obviously, we can double check. But, but things, I mean, things don't seem to be allocated. I mean, so so here, if you just look at Hardwick and Lindenville, mm -hmm. um, we're two hundred there at one ninety one on 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 network. Yep. On the install, again, similarly close. Similarly, on services, you get down to contingency. It's very different. I mean, it's in our favor, but it it just seemed. Yeah. Not look at the contingency line on my head, may have the wrong number. And the VEPSA so, management and support, which seems to be the same as the, the same amount of yeah. contingency. Well, it's basically we took 10% of the project for management support, 10% oh, and divided it between management support and contingency. So each one's about five. 10% of the total across all the systems. Correct. Then allocated. Okay. Yeah, it just looks like it's a different allocation factor to mm. me. Yep, it looks a little off. Um, so yeah. anyhow, that we'll was, go back and check that. That out. was a question that I had. Yep. So recognize, I'll check the contingency piece of it again. But um, the concept here is we'll take the common costs, allocate them out to everybody or at us. So and Vepsa will manage those those pieces. Uh, like the, the what, is the, what are the service the, the things that are called services network and service on this this sheet should be just upfront costs costs to implement the project correct those aren't annual costs those are those are upfront costs so okay fine uh, these are mostly attached to the Clara contract okay. so the the HW network is the DCU installation designed primarily in okay. the units. The installation is having a Claire come out and help us so, install them. So the 444 is that's when the project is complete, you will have spent 444 and then you're up and running. On on, on the common, common piece, on the on the communications network and the training aspect. The next page is, is individual cost. Okay. You go to the next page, it's specific. So this is additive. This is this mm -hmm. is an addition. And so here you've got electric endpoints, water endpoints, the, the software fees. So the, the last page was the design of the software and standing it up. And so why would you have and the annual fees? Is that one year fee or That's, multiple years? Or why, why would you put annual fees in? So the annual fee is something they're going to charge us going forward every year every year is, every year becomes so so that's a little odd that sort of apples and oranges mixing that in so we call it the first years right so it was year one cost is what we're looking yeah. at so this is this is remember specific year one cost 
the, the meter installation cost is an estimate. Well, just to stay on that point for one second, is that third column software annual fees, is that the only annual fee, the only recurring cost on here, Ken? Yes. On this chart, there may be some others other places. I'm so just asking about this chart. Problem. Yeah, just want to make sure so that there's clarity yeah. for them. Yeah, so. they're I'm hedging a little bit because I think the on the common side built into the network, there's like cell phone company costs okay. that would be an annual ongoing thing. All right. We go on the separate sheet on that. That's not even what's yep. the annual cost. Uh, it's like, I think you have it somewhere, don't you? Yeah. yeah, I think he has it coming up. So again, looking at the meter installation costs, well, we're, what, 20%, more than 20% less than, than, than Lindenville, but on the number, on the common cost piece, we're more than Lindenville, and if that was allocated on the basis of meters, it just seems odd to me again. Yeah. But the, I mean, just look, my sense is that, is that the network cost allocation for us is high. Yeah. On the common costs. Good. The, com the common does look out of whack. So I'm going to have to go back and check. And I think you're you're right. Some of these. Um, I mean, when I look at this, where we are relatively on the specific costs, I wouldn't have expected the common costs to have been higher given what we know about our system. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think, I think the. I would have thought they would have been lower. It looks like there's, again, it looks like the cell reference error got to fix on the management and contingency. Bring that down. It puts you more in line with where you would be in relation to women. So I will have to check those numbers and get back to you. Good. So I have to see this. Um, but at the end of the day, we're talking about 1.2, 1.3 million. Before the subsidy. So right yeah, before the subsidy. Yeah. And so the, the meter installation costs are an estimate based on $35 a meter. But we're presuming most of the members say they're going to do that themselves. Yeah, we're a little short staff right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, this isn't going to happen. I mean, the timing on probably this, 2026 it, for it, these guys. I think we're, we're going forward tonight, just as a, I mean, we're still, we're going to be looking at this in when? Two years? Probably two years. Yeah. yeah. So um, hopefully we won't be short staff. Yeah. I'd probably budget it sooner. Come to stay. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no. The other, thing, the other thing you might do is, you know, there may be some folks that are that are in town that we've had a historic relationship. Like one of our guys that retired last year is doing his after one one month off of Beamers. He's going to stick on with us in Morrisville for twenty hours a week, basically through our installation of our AMI. He's going to go around and help with the AMI meters in, which would be cheaper than hiring a contractor, you know. So That's great. we can see if there's someone in Hardwick like that. You know, yeah. Who knows, right? We've also got you know some of the utility, like, again, getting back to the sharing resources, the Barton and Orleans are sharing crews to do this. One may provide some crews. So there, there the could other, be options. The other piece of the installation be aware of is that, you know, all, all basically you're replacing all your meters. And that means your system, your 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 CIS system has to have brand new meters created for every one of those real time enough to keep your billing cycles intact. So basically every day or two, whatever's been meters have been changed out, brand new has to be done in the CIS. Yeah. So there's a there's an impact on Beth's team as well. It has with, to be factored with in. With keeping track of the history right. though, Correct. of a customer, Correct. so that if things are out of so, whack, we can notice yeah. it. Which most is, most people only think about the, the in the field impact of it, but there's definitely an office staff impact that we just have yeah. to factor in. And Beth and I haven't even talked about that yet. Yeah. You know, it's not pertinent until you decide if you want to, that yeah. you're going to do it or not. <laughs> uh, CIS vendor costs in here, we, we Frankly, Linden and uh, Morrisville, because they use the Harris 
North Star system, and we have experience with Harris charging more for integration where we bump them up. Most everybody else is in the 20 to 30,000 range. Um, and those that's based on quotes we've gotten from some of the vendors. So where this says maintenance costs, what I was kind of looking for was operating, annual operating costs, which would include maintenance. Is there, is that what this is? Is this, well, and a lot of other things too, but this is, for example, cellular or anything else. Yeah, so this, 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 the, well, you're on to the uh, ongoing year two through five. Yeah. Yeah. So that, the, the cellular, cellular would be, um, Included in the that's the common costs, which turn into an annual annual number. So this the twenty nine thousand would be software costs ongoing from the Clara. It would be include any. Um, so I think just for us, so we're so we're we have clarity. Mm -hmm. The simple cost. Simple way to think about it is make sure we have an all-in view of the project implementation costs. Yep. Then we need to know what's it going to cost us every yeah. year, starting with year two. Right. right. And then when we say what it's going to cost, we don't want a subset of our costs like maintenance. We want to have the totality. Yep. So you understand. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the number, the maintenance costs here would be all of the costs associated with payments to VEPSA, payments to Eclara, any of the communications would be rolled into this. What it's not going to include is any costs you associate with the operation here at Hart. So we, okay. can, but we need to know what those are. What are what would they be? So incremental. The way I look at it, your, your incremental meter operation would be very similar to what you're paying now. You're not going to get rid of any crews. Okay. You're not. So we're built into this ongoing cost. Well, that's not a cost of this. That's in other words. So you're thing. saying that this maintenance does have all the operations. Well, it's got our best guess, right? So we've assumed that the meters you're installing are going to last a certain period of time before you have to start buying new. We haven't included any um, replacement, any replacement costs. Yeah. So not under I'm warranty. kind of surprised. Usually, these companies like Clara, they don't just get money from the going in; and they get money from the end of the year. But that is important. They'll get part of it. But that's but it's only twenty nine now. Well, for you, for us, yeah. it's two hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Right? No, that's super. I'm just trying to make sure. That's why, like we. Because of that, like if we had put this out to bid as a single utility, nobody would have bid, right? Only with the power of multiplying by 11 did we get someone like the Clara to even look at us twice. They're assuming, I mean, when they, when they do this, they, all these companies are assuming that once you've got their software and their meters, you're kind of their customer, you have no choice. Yeah. yeah. So you're gonna buy more meters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and once you, you load once you hit year eight, nine or 10, and you start having meter failures, we, you know, which he rightly said is not in here because who knows when it's going to happen, but it's going to start happening. We have to buy them back from a Clara, right? So that that's when they get that recurring work. You know, so great. Let's jump to the next phase because that's yep. the So that's the financial one. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So right. you went to the step of saying, "Hey, we'll get, we'll get along." Right. So we'll work out the loan. What's the the amount of the loan is covering basically our non-subsidized costs? Yeah. So the way the way this is set up, it's um, we've already got the loan. We, we actually entered it for operating revenue um, because the the grant is reimbursable. Mm -hmm. We need to pay the bills, and then we the yeah. state pays us back. So we borrowed money. Or four million dollars uh, for operating cash that's convertible to a longer-term loan if the 
individual members want to do that. So we have what rate? It's 5.28% and it can go up to 10 year, 10 year long. Is it fixed? Fixed, fixed rate, yeah. And, and is it a, is it an interest only or is it amortizing? It's amortizing. And if rates drop, you can always refinance. Correct. Okay. And so that that's nice. So then so the debts where you say utility specific. So this is set up so the, the common allocation. This is a hardwood electric slide. This is hardwood yep, electric hard specific. You're specific. You if you had us yep. fund your meters and everything else. Um, so that would be a 10-year loan. And then you've got the Eclara maintenance piece. So we tried to set it up completely flexible. So some of the members told us, well, common costs or specific, we don't care. We got a bucket of money sitting in the bank that we're worried about getting dinged on. So we're going to pay all those costs up front. And then other members have said, well, we want to buy our own meters, but we want you to finance the common costs for us. And so we're trying to set this up. So sure. you pick and choose well, what right. you want us but to But this has the whole, this, is, this would this assume be everything. you're having us pay for everything. Including the annual maintenance. And that's the part that I- No, think. no, that's just because he had it in. Oh, you just year. added it in as the but annual cost? He added cost. it in the, in the upfront cost okay. for that first yeah. year, which is fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so the annual maintenance you get built anyway, if Claire is going to bill us, we're going to turn around and bill the members. But you'd be fine. I, I, I'm just reading this. So the finance piece is the common allocation, potentially the common allocation, and the utility specific debt service, right. and and the and the total annual cost with the financing is the bottom line. What's making it go up every year is the contract with Eclara. We we built in here. Eclara has an ability to raise to a certain amount. Yeah, we added. We added. We assumed they were going to raise it the full amount every year. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean that's nothing. I mean, that's and then that's, that's, that's a sure. common allocation that also goes up. Yeah. What drives that up? Uh, we're assuming inflation on that. Or is it? Three. I believe it's three percent. Why? 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 But on the common allocation. Go back to what was mm -hmm. the common allocation. I mean, to the extent that that's capital costs. No. The common costs are not are, are up were the upfront costs. Mm -hmm. So those are those are capital costs. Why again? Yeah. What's the annual? What's the, what what's the annual piece of that? If this if it's not annual, it shouldn't be going up if it's a fixed rate loan. Or is yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I prefer you guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I think those should end in year 10. I think you're right. Well, some of it de does end in year 10, it looks like, on the loan anyway. Well, the, the specific ends in year 10. Yeah, what it should be both. What well, we need to know is what's the composition yeah. of that common allocation. Is it just debt service or is there something else in it? Yeah, no, it should be just debt service. Or the, and do you, do you have any inter do you have any model. internal costs to manage this over time that you've applied inflation to? Yeah, like that's the not people. the loan, like Grace's time and you know those sort of things. No, okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, and this is just for clarity. This yeah. is just sort of diligent clarity. No, no, I think it's been a change decision. Yeah, but that would be a good follow-up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm taking so away. Why, yeah, why they continue if it's yeah, if it's debt service, it should stop at your 10. If it's not debt service, what is it? One can play it. Can I have a question? Can Go I ahead. have a question? What I did not Go. see, what I did not see in there, and you may or may not know, or maybe I missed it, is I know our CIS software vendor charges an annual maintenance fee to maintain that integration. Uh, okay. That is not in there. Okay. That's a good point. That's, that's, you that's my experience with all these software companies. Yeah. They really get you every year. Hmm. Yep. But that that we're checking. That actually new. So yeah, if you've got an idea what that would cost, like we need to know that because 
what we're finding with North Star, at least, that's the one we've talked to so far, they whack you when you do the integration, but then it's part of your annual maintenance fees going forward. So there's not a separate charge attached to that. I'll find but, out how Meridian handles it, but I do know there is an annual maintenance fee. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you saying you know people there, Beth? Just a few. <laughs> I've only been associated with them since 1992. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Good. Good. And again, this is just for clarity and really understanding it. So yeah. if, if we forget about all those questions, just if we were to assume these numbers are, are where they'll land. So we got this 117,000 and growing up. Um, and what we have to what we have to figure out is the next step analytically would be okay, gee, when you spread that around to all the ratepayers, does it become such a small number? It really doesn't matter, right? Um, yep. So that levelized rate impact. So no benefits. In other words, that's assuming that there's no benefits. That there's no savings. There's no savings, savings at all. No economic savings. There's all the benefits he talked about. Right, but no economics. But not savings. no economics. Right. I mean, the last time we had this conversation, we had a debate about well, is there staff savings? Is there power savings? Yes. So if you just look at it. So what we're getting for this is is a whole lot of information about the system and and. Operational improvements and savings, right. and you're and difficult to quantify from a value standpoint. Right. Yep. Um, yep. And 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 getting better customer service. <clears throat> and to the extent you're able to get customers to move usage off peak, then you potentially this is, yeah. This is this is this is, this is leaving aside all the stuff associated with rate design. So what we, we, the commission what we need. Scott sitting in his seat to assure us, and then we need all of us as commissioners to be confident in it, is that it's that going, we're going to find a way to go and extract those benefits. Absolutely. And, and we think there's a way to get $100,000 a year of benefits. And if we can do that, then all the strategic merits and the one time yeah. Again, a lot of the benefits, though, are, are not readily quantifiable. You know, I mean, in other words, the ability, what Reno was talking about, about knowing where the average is, you get a more satisfied yep. customer because they, they get restored faster. Yep. Probably it's more efficient restoration, but it's not going to, it, it's worth something, but have, what, what, what yeah. value do you put on it? Because, but it's not crazy. It's, you know, $100,000 between real savings and improved service levels and more efficient use of our stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at it this way. I, I I mean I will tell you I would be inclined to to move forward on this. Yeah, I would too. I don't. I appreciate that we're not voting tonight. I think it's not. I think, I think, I think, all the I think so too. Mm -hmm. And I, as I, I wrote to Roger earlier, I think yeah. you're you're just getting this tonight. You ought to stew on it and yeah. and let it soak. Right? You've got a little time. Ken yeah. told you the timeline, so um, it's not urgent tonight. It's a pretty big decision. And for the average. Ratepayer, we have take a residential. Um, if you divide one hundred eight thousand, how many dollars is that per household? Well, per we've got forty four hundred customers. So if you just said so, if it was just even, oh. if it was just even, uh, is is like twenty dollars a customer. It's it's less than two dollars per, per year. Less than two dollars a month. Right. So I think my suggestion, make sure you agree, Lynn, my suggestion is rather than go through the whole thing, the next meeting, maybe bring the whole thing together with any change or addition you do and have one page that just says, you know, here's the upfront cost now for the finance and try to jam into one page. Yep. The whole picture, okay. and that should be pretty compelling. I think so. The, I think so. I know the thing he didn't. Pretty. The thing he didn't say that I wrote in my note that I know none of you want to hear 
but there's also the regulatory compliance stuff that you know the state if we yeah. say no now the state's going to make us and they're going to take the rent money and i like putting i know you much. hate that idea like um, that but much. it doesn't make it less true but that could be in the very <laughs> bottom and said and by the way you probably have your butt kicked but but yeah. i, I, I no, this was this was immensely this was, this was helpful and, yeah. and your piece was very helpful yeah. um because i was persuaded by the first part i, I didn't, yeah. didn't leaving aside the mandates yeah I mean, to me, the, the operational stuff, which I think we just yeah. did not get a handle on when we looked at this earlier, yep. is is just a huge it's a big deal. difference. And and with the floods and the winds and all this stuff. Um, yes. We're going to be in an environment. And, and, and all the stuff that's on here. Right. Correct. Even if only half of it we have to do. Yeah. Um, Mike, what I... I don't know how we're going to do this, but I I think that that Miles and and Mike need to get up to speed, and I'm not sure that just looking at this without explanation. Yeah. I'm happy. I'll that, I'll get a hold of them and invite them wonderful. in and talk with them. I mean, I I'm not as conversant as Ken, of course, but I'm conversant yeah. enough to walk them through this. That would, that would and, and it kind of. It, it kind of helps a little bit to start at the end yep. of, look, we've now worked this and Dutch has got a way to finance it where we're not going to come out of pocket and it's going to add up to you know right. what you just cited, this right. much for rate payer household. So we think we now have a place where it's kind of a push. It's just good. And, and that makes all the other stuff compound. Right. The strategic is there for Oh, that's exactly right. Yep. Yep. I and mean, I don't know what your average residential bill per, per month here is. Most most are around 100 bucks a month, um, you know, in, in Bepsa land. So a, a point and a half or whatever that was, it's a buck, buck 50 a month yeah. that you're talking about for a residential customer-ish, right? Yeah. That's not nothing. I don't mean to say it is, but, yeah. you know. That's good. Yep. Through the years that <clears throat> this has developed, I can remember years ago people opposed having AMI yep. metering. Yeah, and how much opposition, how much can they resist having that information from their household put out? Yep. Can they object to this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So each, out, right? the way the state of legislature Put in place that you have to allow customers to opt out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so every individual customer can decide that I don't want this, and, you, and you're obligated to leave their existing meter in place. Okay. Once we have data, then they may be able to do the right thing with their meter in place. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So so where everybody else can go to time of use, they would be they stuck can. on whatever your right. All the services that come in the future. They're going to want some of them, and they're going to be told you can't. But we're going to have an educational thing. Yep, everyone will. And um, would the cost and reflection to each individual um, customer that we have also reflect to them if no. they opt out? They're still going to be paying the same rate. It's, so it's all going to be done through rates. Customers aren't going to be charged for it. Right. Individual. Will be aligned. Right. But it's going to be in added into the rate. Yep. Yep. So they'll pay for it even if they opt out. Right. Is that's the what point. I'm getting at. That's, yeah. And, and I, I've only thought about it in about 10 seconds, but I would think in today's environment, rather than getting into all the complicated benefits, you just say, look, this meter is going to tell us when you're down. We're going to know when you're down, right. the minute you're down. You don't have to call us to tell us you're down. And we're going to know the whole street versus just you. And we're going to have you out there. That's and right. That shit, I, I think that'll... We're going to know if it's in your house or if it's on our line so that we don't, well, we don't, we don't come true. out and then bill you yeah. for a problem that was in your house. Yeah. It might be that simple. And you'll still have people yeah, under privacy. Well, yeah. Three, four, five percent might opt out at the beginning, but then they they come back in over time. Yeah. You know, just as we were saying, they hear about you know not being able to find out that they're out or not, and about a program, and they start to come back in. You know, there are many reasons for people to opt out as single lady. Sure, may want 
may not want the industry to know she takes a shower at five o'clock. We're not, not going to have that kind of data. Well, the hot water. But they'll believe we will. People no, will think we do, but you're right. We will. Internet. We're, yeah. not, we're not going to have <laughs> the data in, in the people's houses at this point. This is you're a correct. Okay. It, well, it, it's, giving me, it's giving data at the meter. Mm -hmm. What's uh, going on in the house is 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 going to be behind. We're not going to have correct. we're not going to have we're not going to have fifteen minute readings by appliance. Right. Correct. Yeah. But some people will believe readings. some people will believe that we will even if we tell them that they, right. we don't. Right. But I <laughs> I, I understand that. But but okay. but the answer when they when they when they ask is no. Yep. We're not we're not going to know what time you're taking a shower or what time you're running your dishwasher Correct. or when you're going to sleep or yep. We're just going to know what, what the total electricity is every 15 minutes. Right. right. Yep. Good. Why but, it's there? But, but the Excel usage will show up. It'll show up. How much more you're using in that 15 minutes? Right, later. but we're not going to know yeah. whether that's your, from from putting your okay. lights on, or from running your oven, or from your dishwasher, right. or from okay. your hot water heater. Right. But dealing with this before, and people yeah, would come I'm... out and say, you know, too much about what's going on in my house, and that's going to be the opposition yep. for those who no, do you're right. oppose it. We'll yeah. have that, and the answer will be. So what, what have you seen and heard in terms of adoption? Like the utilities are on the stage or way out of the ground and it's what adoption is. Uh, I think when, when they first mm -hmm. put it in, in 2010 to 12, they were seeing two to two and a half percent opted out. And then over time, I think Burlington's down to like half a percent at this point. Yeah. Yep. So those are your quotes. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So there'll be some, but there won't be a lot. Yeah. Yep. Good. Well, thank you thank for you doing so that. Thank you very much for Would you like to take some questions? At all. We're well, we're here some for the executive this session. Is really yeah. sad. In a way, you know, I would hold this out as a great model because when we talk about anything now, when we talk about wealth and hydro, it's always going to be this mix of the hard numbers plus the view of the future. And we just got to make sure that we're always looking at both. And we did that for us. Yeah. You know, that we're looking yeah. at it. Because sometimes you feel like you get bullied. I'm used to from a career in corporations <laughs> and everybody in a corporation saying they need to buy this new thing or spend money on that new thing. Everybody's got and an you, agenda. You just got to have a way to. That's right. You got to sort it out and yep. do the right strategic things, but never fail to look at the real numbers. <laughs> you know. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. You, know, you guys know from running organizations. Otherwise, you spend too much money. Agreed. So for next meeting, I'll verify these numbers, make sure the allocation is correct, bring back your one pager, and you can have another conversation. Like, and we'll plan to put it on the agenda as a vote to warn it. And, yep. Know, yeah. Yep. And I'll try to get with Miles and Mike before the meeting and walk through the deck and do all that. That'd be great. Okay. And Ken is also here for the executive session. So I would say for the GM report, I'll just answer questions rather than report to you on it. That's what I already wrote, um, just to be time sensitive. I had, I had two questions. I was just wondering what kind of permit we need for the handicap plan. Um, the, we encroach on the right on the um, setback. Ah, okay. Um, okay. So we had to get a zoning permit for that. Okay. I didn't think we needed building permits. It's not a building permit. Maybe I wrote a building permit. No, you didn't. You didn't. You said Actually, permit. Been interesting. <laughs> Good thing it happened in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, yeah. That one's, there's a story behind that one. Not tonight. <laughs> I was just curious what the roof and uh, what the roofs were going to cost. So the the roof bids, we got two of them about the same price. So I'm trying to figure out which one to do over across the street. That's around ten thousand five um, for that roof. Okay. And then the okay. one on the shop is uh, 64,000, which that's a big roof. So that's, big that's roof, not yeah. surprising either. So Are somebody had said we've got, a, somebody had told me we, no, that won't be asphalt. That'll be, um, I forget what they're doing on that. I think they're going to put another corrugated, a new corrugated on top. Um, but that, somebody told me they got a bid a few years ago for 100,000 for that roof, 
which is why they didn't do it. And now it's 64. So, so I thought that was a yeah. good price. Yeah. Just curious if they included the pipe, new furnace pipe chimney. No, I didn't have them do that. I didn't know that that was a problem. That is. But we get we get a different um, vendor for that. That's a different vendor, so we can do that. Yeah. Yep. Good. So good memory. It's happening. That was a good idea. I tried to get it done three years ago. All right. Good to know. I can. I did. I haven't heard that from the crew yet. It's totally wrong. <laughs> I think the crew's trying to get one thing out of me at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing it. <laughs> that sounds like a non-debatable good investment. Oh, it's a good, it's good. Oh, it's good. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut off the session. Are there any other questions about the manager's report? Uh, any questions about the financials? I I Beth, I had one question. It just kind of jumped out at me. Yeah. Um on page 18 on the key indicators. Uh-huh. Um, on cash on hand. How do yes. the budget and the actual amount come out to the same dollar year to date? Okay. Year to date budget. Yeah. And year to date actual for cash on hand are the same number. Year to date actual. They're and, both and the month. That's why it's the it's but not it's the, the month. The month and the year to date will be the same. Because yep. it's just a running total. No, 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 no. Uh, can't, I'm not okay. This ca the cash flow section at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The the first line is oh, I see that hand. one. Yeah, yeah. She's looking at the next one down. There's two cash on hands. Yeah. I'm not for year to date about actual and year to date budget. Yeah. Because that's that was at the beginning of the year, so we started out at the same point at the beginning of the year with the budget. To we were at the same point with what we actually had, and we started budgeting from there. So the so the so the year to date actual in that case is actually the year beginning. Correct. Not actual in that case. Well, year no. to date actual the cash on hand year to date is what we had as of January one. Right. So, so the year-to-date the... budget was also cash on hand January 1. Oh, so that's not year-to-date. It's that's not, not June. Correct. It's not year-to-date. Correct. Year-to-date is actually the cash on hand there, like one, two, three, four, that's... below the yeah. line. Yeah. I get it. It's miss. The, it's not it's, labeled. It's, it's not, yeah, it's not year-to-date actual yeah, or correct. budget. It's not year-to-date. It's correct. It's, okay. It's year, it's start of year. It's start of year. Okay. That top line is started the year, but the numbers below that are year to date. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now that and no, it made perfect sense why the actual and the month were the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I, <clears throat> and thank you. I, I figured there was an answer. Yeah, yeah. It just seemed on. Um, where do we see? You know, when I look in the, um, we've got the accounts payable, and we see all the stuff that we're paying all the the contractors for the fiber. Uh, yes. work. But where where does where does the pay, where do, where where, does where the do the come? payments that we receive show up, and 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 are we getting those on a timely basis? Great question. Okay, the payments payments were received from whom? I didn't hear that. From the from the fiber companies to reimburse us for all the cutting. They are in technically they sit in account one hundred seven two zero, which is our construction in progress as a credit. It is considered as cash coming in in the cash flow statement. But as far as on the accounts, it is sitting in 10720 as a credit. Normally 10720 is a debit because that's I what we consider direct construction. Charges. You said 107.20? See if you that's yeah. on page 26. Yeah, I'm on uh, three six or two six? Two six. Yeah, I'm looking at that. So that's a that was 118,000 and change. Just okay, so actually yeah. that account is supposed to be a debit, like a positive number, because that is actually what we're probably going to be putting into plant. This is actually setting out there as a credit because we've collected so much money up front. 
So it looks like it looks like we've collected more money than we've actually spent, which is true because we collect the money up front. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know what? I'm going to park this and we okay. can talk about here. So Beth, Beth and I will uh, come ready to explain how, how the whole fiber inputs and outputs hit the books in the next meeting. How's that? Yeah. Yeah. We can do yeah. that. Yep. Happy to do it. Does anybody else have anything on the, on the financials? Okay. Which takes us. The only thing I have on financials is whoever has the checks to sign, make sure I get them back. Oh, oh you have them. I, I didn't oh. have them, but. Uh, I don't care who signs them. I just I want to make sure it happens. I just need a pen. I, gotta, I don't think you want me to sign it in pencil. I got I to gotta keep the staff happy with getting checks moving. <laughs> There's only three of them. Do you want to go into executive session while you do that? Sure. Somebody can make a motion and do all of that. I move to. Oh, I I move that we go into executive executive session to discuss a personnel matter. Wait a second. I second. Um, it is eight forty five, and we are in executive session. Can you take the recording off, Beth? Yeah. <laughs> it is nine sixteen, and we are out of executive session. No action was taken. Is there a motion to adjourn? A move to adjourn. Second. And we are adjourned at 9.16. Thank you all. Thank you Sorry, all. Sorry, this is long. Look, so. people take some bagels. I brought plastic bagels.